We are on live, ma'am. Good evening. It's a beautiful Tuesday evening out there in Chennai. The weather is changing and it doesn't sound look like a typical May weather. We are, we are blessed here as of now. And IFS Tamil Nadu and IFS South Tamil Nadu are happy to be do doing this webinar. And SHIELD has been kind enough to sponsor this every third Tuesday for us. And this time we have in association with us the special interest group on reproductive endocrinology of Indian Fertility Society. So we have a very good program on thyroid and fertility. So I would be very happy to invite both our chairpersons for this evening. We have Dr. Ramani Devi, who's the patron of IFS South Tamil Nadu. And we have Dr. Uma Vail Murugan uh, from Trichy. And uh, those who know Dr. Ramani Devi have uh, uh, been uh, aware she's a person who contributes a lot to OBG and her special passion any day is endometriosis. She was the chairperson of Foxy Endometriosis Committee. She was the vice president of um, uh, Foxy in 2020. And currently, she's a patron of TNFOG as well. And she is the managing director of Ramakrishna Medical Center, Janani Fertility Center. And it, when it comes to putting up an academic program, there will be no hesitation. So we are very happy to have Dr. Ramani Devi with us uh, this evening to guide us through the program. And uh, Dr. Uma. From Trichy is a very good friend. She's a consultant at Apollo Hospital. She's the managing director at Venus Fertility Center. And she's had many years of experience. And uh, from Trichy, we have both these uh, beautiful doctors who full of vibrant uh, energy. And she's also the joint secretary of Triox. And we are very happy to have her this evening to take us uh, through this reproductive endocrinology program. Because thyroid disorders have always baffled women. And any endocrine gland uh, with, the, with the metabolic impact can have so many different aspects uh, to be affected. And we as fertility consultants are keen to know how thyroid plays a role in uh, uh, affecting the uh, optimal fertility of a woman. So I request Dr. Ramani Devi and Dr. Uma to take the proceedings forward. Good evening, uh, Dr. Rajapriya and all the learned people of uh, IFS Tamil Nadu, as well as all the endocrinology people and Sweta Metal uh, SIG group for uh, endocrinology. Now, let us start with the top, first uh, session. Uh, the speaker will be introduced by Dr. Uma Velmurugan. Uma? Uh, yeah, I'm traveling, madam. Can you just introduce the speaker? I'll join you. Yeah, no time. problem. No problem. Okay. Uh, uh, I'll just put uh, Dr. Anjali. Yeah. Put the CV. Chitrakala, put the CV. Yes, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Anjali Satya, who is a renowned consultant from Chennai Vijaya Health Center and Hospitals from 2006 till date. And uh, she was also for uh, Madras Medical Mission. She has been working from 2006 to 2015 and Apollo Specialty Hospitals one from 2014 till date. She has won many accolades and awards. Accuracy of filter paper method for measuring glycated hemoglobin. She was awarded the second prize for Dr. J.C. Patel and Dr. B.C. Mehta Award under the category of Original Article for the year 2006 and 2007. Her areas of special interest are reproductive endocrinology, diabetes, pituitary and thyroid and adrenal disorders. I think uh, she'll, can, she'll, be a, uh, she'll be giving us a very good introduction regarding today's topic uh, that is pathophysiology of uh, uh, pathophysiology links between thyroid and fertility. See, in general, women they have a higher incidence of thyroid dysfunction compared to men. And again, in the infertile population, though we, we screen the TSH for every woman who is coming to us with infertility, still we have to think about the antibodies that are present. Even the positive antibodies are going to have an impact upon fertility. So I think uh, she'll be the right person to give us the link that is between the thyroid and infertility. Over to Dr. Anjali. 
thank you, ma'am, for that kind of introduction. Uh, I would like to thank the uh, IFS Society for giving me this opportunity. Uh, it's a great honor for me. So I'll share my presentation. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, make it a full screen. Yeah, I have made it a full screen. Is it? Uh, am I no, on? No, no. It's not come to the slideshow mode as yet. Slideshow no. mode. Yeah. It's visible. Make it slideshow mode. Uh, I think in my this thing it's coming as one minute. One minute, please. No, go to the custom slideshow. Yeah, third one. Third one. Yeah, yeah sure, sure. Or go to that. Uh, yeah, from the beginning you go. Is this uh, okay? No, you click okay. that from beginning. You click that. Yeah, slideshow, custom slideshow, it's not. Yeah, maybe you go to from, from beginning, the first. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Is it okay now? No, not yet. Not yet. Okay, I think I'll take help from my son. A minute, please. No, no, no. You are, you just come down uh, below the your slides. There are three things. Slide sorter and the next one. Uh, is yes, slide. yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is it okay? Uh, you, you press it. Yes, yeah, is this fine? Yeah, you press it that. You press that. I, I press that. Okay. But still not yeah. okay. Oh my God. All right. Uh, can you give me a minute, please? I'll just uh, yeah, call yeah. my son. Adi? So any day the technical help available at home is our young teen son. Young teen, yeah. <laughs> Teens are always tech service. Yeah, and they will have a good laugh at us, all the great things you do, and you need my help end of the day. Is this fine? Uh, no, ma'am. Ma'am, or else start sharing again, ma'am. All right, I'll do that. Stop share. Okay. Uh, share. So I go to this custom slide show this. Is this full screen now? No, no. So pro probably we just give up and move forward. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. yeah, what shall we do? Do you think you can guide up? Uh, yeah, now it is full screen. Oh, okay. okay. Is it now uh, seen well? Yes, okay. yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm so sorry yeah. for the technical glitch. I'm not very tech savvy. Sorry for my apologies. <laughs> Thanks. Any of us are your boat only. Don't worry. Okay, okay. So uh, I'll be talking on thyroid disorders and uh, subfertility, the pathophysiologic links. Um, now, it's well known that normal thyroid function is very important to maintain normal reproduction. But uh, a statement like that doesn't mean that uh, treating thyroid disorders itself can correct subfertility because most of the time uh, in any couple for that matter, uh, the causes are multiple. It's usually multifactorial and thyroid uh, etiology may be one of them. Now, when we look at the thyroid hormone receptors, they are ubiquitous. They are seen all over the system, almost on every cell in the body. And thyroid hormone is required for the normal uh, cellular development and proliferation. So as regards the uh, reproductive system, the thyroid hormone receptors, uh, the deiodinase enzyme, as well as the thyroid hormone transporters have been well documented on the surface of the oocyte. It has been seen on extravillous tropoblast, so it has a role in implantation has been seen even documented in embryo and seen in the endometrium and questionable whether it is seen on the acrosome cap. So the thyroid hormones are involved in almost all phases of reproduction. So it can start with the oocytes and ovulation. Here T3, which is the biologically active form of thyroid hormone, it combines along with FSH and enhances granular cell proliferation, inhibits its apoptosis, 
the transporters and receptors I have already mentioned are expressed in the ovary, even on the surface of the oocytes. Uh, in sperm, hypothyroidism has an adverse effect on spermatogenesis. It can affect the sperm counts and morphology. Hyperthyroidism generally is associated with sperm motility and is well-documented DNA damage. But we don't have any studies available or possible mechanisms by which uh, here spermatogenesis is affected by thyroid disorders. Now, fertilization and embryogenesis, hypothyroidism is associated with lower fertilization rates, especially when it is overt and disturbed embryogenesis. Again, we do not have great studies on pathophysiology here. Thyroid hormone receptors, both alpha and beta, have been documented in endometrium. And there could be an evidence for direct effect of thyroid hormone on endometrial receptivity, but studies are lacking. And this is an area where probably more research is required. As regards implantation, I think this is one area in uh, fertility treatment and assisted reproduction where we have not mastered the act because we do not know what exactly causes implantation failure. Now, it has been seen that patients with thyroid autoimmunity have a higher prevalence of miscarriages. And hence, it is believed that thyroid hormones also probably may have a direct or an indirect role in implantation failure. Placentation, uh, again, thyroid hormone receptors have been documented in the extravillous trophoblast. And T3 has been found to increase the expression of uh, metalloproteinases 2 and 3, and also fetal fibronectin and integrin molecules, uh, which can help in early placental placentation. So now let us look at these two individual axes. This is the hypothalamo pituitary thyroid axis. The TRH hormone comes from the hypothalamus and it acts on the anterior pituitary uh, to stimulate uh, TSH production. This TSH acts on the thyroid gland to release the T3 and T4. T4 is converted to T3, which is a biologically active form. And in all endocrine glands, we have an active feedback regulation. Here also, here also the thyroid hormones exert a negative feedback. So in hypothyroidism, we have fall in thyroid hormone levels. And there is a, because of the negative feedback and there is a fall in thyroid hormone levels, there is a, a increase in TRH molecule. Also, it has been found that an ectoenzyme called pyro, uh, PP2, it, it, it uh, normally catalyze, catabolizes the TRH uh, molecule that gets inactivated in hypothyroidism and there is a high TRH level in primary hypothyroidism. This TRH may cause secondary increase in hyperprolactin uh, hormone and that explains hyperprolactinemia in patients with uh, overt hypothyroidism. And hyperprolactinemia also has secondary effect on uh, uh, reproductive capacity because it suppresses GnRH pulse regulator. Other influences on this HPT axis is the autonomic nervous system. It has been found that sympathetic input reduces the blood flow, whereas parasympathetic uh, input stimulates the blood flow. The neuropeptides in the brain also have an active influence on this HPT axis, like the neuropeptide by from the hypothalamus has a decreased or inhibitory effect, whereas vasointestinal peptide has a stimulatory effect. So this particular axis is under lot of external influences and what we are going to talk about is this interplay with the hypothalamo pituitary ovarian axis and this is what we i think we are very familiar the gnrh pulse regulator which secretes the lh and fsh fsh acts on the granulosa cell lh acts on the theca cell stimulating the production of estrogen and progesterone and again there is a feedback mechanism here the only difference is estrogen has a positive as well as a negative feedback effect and other external influences on this would be, again, neuropeptides. There's a new peptide called as kispeptin, which can have an active role in uh, influencing the GnRH pulse regulator. Also, ad adipose tissue, which is considered a very active endocrine organ, releases leptin, which also has a stimulatory effect on the hypothalamic neurons. So these target hormones cause all these development, which is well known to all of us. And what is the role of thyroid and prolactin, as I mentioned? There is a high TRH value in hypothyroidism, which increases prolactin. But what is observed is this increase in prolactin levels is usually mild to moderate. We wouldn't see a value exceeding 50 or 60. This hyperprolactinemia is good enough to impair the pulsatile secretion of GnRH and interfere with ovulation. And that explains subfertility in this category of patients. 
the prevalence of hyperprolactinemia is higher in primary hypothyroidism and we do not observe this generally in the subclinical hypothyroidism which is a very mild thyroid hormone deficiency state uh, this mentioned i mentioned earlier a neuropeptide called kispeptin which has been encoded by kis1 gene it also is uh, found to have a very strong role in influencing the gnrh pulse regulator and has an important value in pubertal maturation and regulation of reproductive function now i just want to bring attention to this hormonal changes in thyroid disorders so this table mentions both thyrotoxicosis and hypothyroidism now what i want you to observe are two major changes one is in the levels of sex hormone binding globulin this sex hormone binding globulin is elevated in thyrotoxic patients and is generally suppressed in patients with hypothyroidism so when there is a fall in sex hormone binding globulin then the total thyroid hormone comes down and the free fraction goes up in thyrotoxic patients because shbg goes up the total fraction goes up and the free hormone comes down the second important change that i would want you to notice is the response to gnr stimulation what is the level of gonadotropins in these set of patients in hyperthyroid patients the gonad basal gonadotropin levels may be either mildly elevated or may be neutral they may be the same in hypothyroidism basal gonadotropins are generally normal but when you offer them gnr stimulation the response to gnr stimulation is obtended in hypothyroidism whereas it is elevated in thyrotoxic patients so these are the two major differences that i wanted to highlight in this table the difference in shbg levels and the response of the gonadotropins to gnr stimulation which is suppressed in hypo and elevated in hyperthyroidism so when we look at the interplay between uh hpt and hpo axis there are multiple factors which lead to ovulatory disturbance high trh causing hyperprolactinemia in thyroid patients hypothalamic pituitary change i just mentioned now that there is an impaired lh response to gnr stimulation in overt hypothyroidism that can lead to ovulatory disturbance also tsh shares a structural analogy to fsh both are glycoproteins and sometimes it can lead to pseudo feedback inhibition of gonadotropins because of high tsh levels there is a, some kind of a spillover effect the shpg level alterations in both thyrotoxic and hypothyroidism which i mentioned earlier can lead to changes in the free uh, sex hormone levels in these individuals so the common thing that we observe in hypothyroidism is menstrual disorders i think we are all familiar almost 40 to 60% of them may have menstrual irregularities especially seen in overt hypothyroidism but recent studies have shown that the menstrual irregularities may not be as high as what was documented earlier that may be because people are detecting hypothyroid earlier and we treat them much earlier so we don't get to see overt disturbances so they may have severe bleeding disorders especially in overt hypothyroidism because the clotting factors are suppressed and it leads to acquired von willebrand's disease so many women can present with menorrhagia oligomenorrhea is also common sometimes they may come with a uh, secondary amenorrhea um so these are the common disturbances in hyperthyroid patients we normally see oligomenorrhea uh, that is common and sometimes polymenorrhea so if you look at the prevalence of thyroid disorders subclinical hypothyroidism we see in 5 to 7% of women commonly seen in women of reproductive age group overt hypothyroidism in 2.2 to 4.5% patients hyperthyroidism is less common and thyroid autoimmunity is documented in almost like 5 to 10% of general population but majority of these patients are asymptomatic unless we look for thyroid antibody titers many of them may actually not come to clinical front so when we evaluate subfertile women in the reproductive age group for subfertility many of them are found to have antibodies but there are many women in the general population who are actually euthyroid but still harbor thyroid antibodies so i think this is not a very familiar slide to the uh, audience what i want to highlight here is that thyroid disorders are extremely common in women of reproductive age group and the female factors relating to subfertility constitutes 35% male factors the ratio earlier when 10 years ago or 20 years ago was 10 is to 1 for male female sex ratio but nowadays we find many men who who are affected by autoimmune thyroid disease and in men uh they present as uh, erectile dysfunction weight gain secondary hyperprolactinemia sometimes even causing uh, ejaculatory dysfunction
but still we do not have guidelines that mention that we need to screen all men for thyroid dysfunction, whereas all subfertile women must be screened for thyroid disorders. Men with erectile dysfunction or ejaculatory dysfunction can be screened. Now, overt hypothyroidism, as I mentioned earlier in women, uh, this is what it causes. Because there is impaired metabolic clearance, everything slows down. There is increased peripheral aromatization, fall in acid BG levels. There is decreased LH response to GNRS stimulation, secondary hyperprolactinemia, insufficient corpus luteum leading to low progesterone that can probably explain uh, higher miscarriage rates in these individuals and menstrual irregularities. These are well documented in clinical scenario. Men, all men with erectile dysfunction must be evaluated for thyroid as well as prolactin level elevation. Ejaculatory dysfunction may be presenting features. Men with abnormal semen parameters could be screened where both morphology and motility could be abnormal but data is lacking in subclinical hypo. Whether men with subclinical hypo document these abnormalities, it's not known. Now, association with adverse fertility outcomes. Now, do we need to treat subclinical hypo? Earlier days, the cutoffs were very low, 2.5. In the 2017 ATA guidelines, it has been found that we need to follow our population-specific cutoffs and not go by the European cutoffs. So we have found that in our general population, the upper limit of normal range is considered to be four. And in fact, most of the studies have shown that adverse fertility outcomes seem to surface at levels above four. But there are no randomized controlled trials to date evaluating the benefit of thyroxine on spontaneous pregnancy rates in women with subclinical hypo. We have studies that look at uh, assisted reproduction in this category of patients but not spontaneous pregnancy. Probably this is again a scope for research in future. Among subfertile women with TAI, we have got three meta-analysis and uh, uh, one was in 2006, then 2011 and 2018. The earlier meta-analysis uh, itself had shown that uh, when levels exceed four, uh, beneficial effect of thyroxine is seen on pregnancy after ART. Now let us talk about thyroid autoimmunity. Do we really need to treat all women with thyroid autoimmunity, whether they are euthyroid or hypothyroid or they are subclinically hypothyroid? Now, in the general population, the prevalence of women with who harbor thyroid antibodies is to the tune of 5 to 10 percent. And I said most of them are asymptomatic. Most of the studies that we have in literature have looked at thyroid peroxidase antibody. They have not looked at thyroglobulin antibodies. So sometimes we see a subset of women who have positive thyroid antibodies who have negative thyroglobulin antibodies, some of them have both of these antibodies, and some others may have isolated elevation of thyroglobulin antibodies. But we need, again, more studies to see whether these individual antibody titers have any bearing on fertility outcomes. So what they say is that women with thyroid autoimmunity, if they have subclinical hypothyroidism, then the chance that as pregnancy happens in these women, this is a state of high demand. And most of these women may actually progress to overt hypothyroidism. So they need to be followed up. Now, thyroid autoimmunity could also reflect a generalized immune imbalance. It may not be totally responsible for what we are observing. And we have already mentioned that thyroid peroxidase has been found to be expressed in the endometrium, the placenta, and even inside the follicular fluid. But what role these antibodies exactly play at these sites, it's still unknown. We have studies which have pooled study data which shows that there is a definite higher prevalence of infertility associated with uh, autoimmune thyroid disease. And in a recently published meta-analysis pooling four studies, uh, most of these uh, studies which showed that high antithyroid antibodies were associated with a higher increase or increased risk of unexplained infertility, higher risk for miscarriages, especially in the first trimester, and recurrent miscarriage rates. Now, TAI is commonly observed in three groups of subfertile women. One is PCOS, well known to us. Almost 30% of women with PCOS may harbor autoimmune thyroid disease, or they may present to us with autoimmune thyroid disease. Women with diminished ovarian reserve or documented primary ovarian insufficiency also need to be screened for thyroid autoimmunity. Again, women in unexplained subfertility, where the causes are known, probably the autoimmunity has a strong role to play. So these are the three categories of patients where we need to screen for thyroid autoimmunity. 
In PCOS, the mechanism of thyroid autoimmunity is considered to be due to polymorphisms of the PCOS-related gene. It's a, uh, called fibrillin-3, and which can actually uh, alter the activity of transforming growth factor beta, which is a regulator of immune tolerance. Also, a high estrogen to progesterone ratio in these individuals may contribute to autoimmunity in women with PCOS. The possible mechanism of autoimmune thyroid disease causing infertility could be an impaired cellular as well as humoral immune response. There is increase in natural killer cell activity, and it is believed that presence of thyroid antibodies also a resulting increase in TSH in these individuals increases interleukin-2 production that stimulates the natural killer cell population, leading to reproductive failures. Also in the endometrium, it has been found that the T cell activity is altered. There are two types of T cells, Th1 and Th2. The Th1, Th2 ratios have been found to be elevated in women who experience miscarriages. So this all is believed to be related to thyroid autoimmunity. This is the clinical observation, which is an extrapolation of what I mentioned. Metalysis of studies have shown that the miscarriage rates in women who have positive thyroid antibodies is definitely higher. And when it comes to subfertility, we have, we have made some observations. That is, when you compare those euthyroid women who are antibody positive to euthyroid women who are antibody negative, the average TSH levels are little on the higher side in the euthyroid women with antibody positive groups. Now, these women, when they go for ART, uh, especially they need to uh, screen the thyroid function before they go for controlled ovarian stimulation. This I have already mentioned that antibodies are found in the follicular fluid in women with TAI, which has been found to be almost half of those of serum levels. They also, observations were made in several studies that oocyte fertilization and grade A embryos were less common and pregnancy rates were lower in women. But now the recent studies have shown that youth thyroid with women with thyroid autoimmunity do not show much change in pregnancy rates and live birth rates. But yes, the miscarriage rates are still higher in this group of women. Vitamin D deficiency, do we have a role? I think we need to see. And uh, Antibodies, whether they alter the fertility by targeting the zona pellucida antigens, that also is something which is a speculation. Now, this I need to mention here because ART uh, involves uh, controlled ovarian stimulation, which is an integral part of ART done with gonadotropins after initial pituitary down regulation. Now, when you do controlled ovarian stimulation, what is observed is a very, very high levels of estradiol level a supraphysiologic dose to the tune of 4,000 to 6,000, which is almost similar to that seen in the second trimester. Now, what this estradiol does is the TBG levels, the thyroxine binding globulin levels also go up very high because of the high E2. And this high thyroxine binding globulin gets sialylated in the liver. And this form of TBG cannot be cleared easily from the circulation. And ultimately what happens, the bound form of thyroid hormone increases and the there is a decrease in the free thyroid hormone level. And when there is a fall in free thyroid hormone levels, there is an increase in TSH levels. So, the so what the observation is, when a woman undergoes controlled ovarian stimulation, there is an elevation in TSH levels as we follow them up after ovarian stimulation. So, it's very important that before we subject these women with thyroid autoimmunity to COS, we check their thyroid levels and try to keep it below 2.5 before you start the ovarian stimulation and then follow them up. In that case, the chance, because whenever we do control ovarian stimulation, it is a strain for the thyroid gland. And sometimes these women may become overtly hypothyroid after controlled ovarian stimulation. So they need to be closely followed up as they move through pregnancy following a COS. So the rate of patients with TSH about 2.5 uh, is more pronounced in treated hypothyroid patients following COS. So if a woman is already hypothyroid and is on thyroxine, Make sure that the levels are less than 2.5 before she undergoes controlled ovarian stimulation. Also, it has been found that women who are positive for thyroid antibodies show a more chance of overt hypothyroidism following a COS. But women who are thyroid antibody negative, the net effect of ovarian stimulation is considered negligible. Similar effects are seen with OHSs, which is far less common these days because of increased usage of GnRH antagonists. OHSs can also lead to severe uh, uh, 
changes in these women with underlying uh, thyroid autoimmunity. Now, what happens in HCG trigger? Now, this is the final step which leads to before egg collection is done. Now, HCG trigger, HCG shares a structural similarity to TSH hormone. So when you, you give a HCG trigger, the HCG levels in the blood rises, and then there is a fall in TSH values because this HCG can go and bind the TSH receptor because of the structural similarity. This happens in early pregnancy as well, which explains gestational thyrotoxicosis. So there is a fall in TSH value and a proportional increase in FT4 following the HCG trigger in this women. Women with TAI do not show a proportional change that is seen in normal women. So there is a blunted TSH and T4 response. So this is something which I wanted to highlight. Now, what about hyperthyroidism and subfertility? Now, we do not have many studies, longitudinal studies, but we have several observational studies. Now, hyperthyroidism and by, and by far, I mean, if you compare it with hypothyroidism, it's generally friendly because most of these women have regular cycles. They're thinner, but they, they continue to ovulate in spite of being thyrotoxic. But yes, if they are overtly hyperthyroid, not on medications, then there is a higher chance of uh, miscarriage. So that is very important. So if a woman is identified to have overt hyperthyroidism, she must be rendered new thyroid with antithyroid drugs, and then only she must go for uh, fertility uh, treatment. So in women, hyperthyroidism, opposed to what is seen in hypo, there is an increase in SHBG levels and estradiol levels. And this elevation is seen in men also, which can explain gynecomastia in some of these men who are thyrotoxic. Menstrual irregularities, most of these women are oligomenorrhic. And they, because most of these women also develop secondary anemia in hyperthyroidism. So they are usually oligomenorrhic and polymenorrhea may be sometimes seen. If untreated, leads to early pregnancy loss. Men, hyperthyroidism can lead to impaired libido, erectile dysfunction, premature ejaculation, which is uh, very classically seen in thyrotoxic men, abnormal sperm parameters, especially motility, and the recent guidelines uh, after endocrine society recently, the European Thyroid Association had uh, recently released uh, guidelines on thyroid disorders and fertility, where it recommends uh, that we should not postpone ART treatment in case of subclinical or overt hypo or hyperthyroidism in the male, as long as the sperm parameters are not severely affected. They can undergo treatment side by side. The only contraindication would be if they have already received radioactive iodine therapy for Graves' disease. In that case, we give them a six-month window period not to try pregnancy. So concluding, thyroid hormones have an immense role in all stages of reproduction. Thyroid autoimmunity is common and it could actually represent a generalized immune dysregulation. It may not be primarily responsible for the outcomes that we witness. So we cannot attribute all that we see to thyroid autoimmunity. There could be other factors in play. Both hypo and hyper can have an adverse effect and adverse pregnancy outcomes. Available data support the routine measurement of TSH in all subfertile women attempting pregnancy. Uh, and uh, we do not check routinely thyroid antibody levels, but the current association, the ETA so guidelines have mentioned that we must screen these women for thyroid antibodies as well and treat those who have TSH above four. Now we do not keep 2.5 as a cutoff. Now, if uh, we use uh, certain criteria, if a woman has a TSH, which is between 2.5 to four, uh, then we would treat these subset of patients only if they are older in age or if they have diminished ovarian reserve or they have very extreme high thyroid antibody titus and are likely to become hypothyroid on controlled ovarian stimulation. So. The cutoffs that we now use for subclinical hypo in subfertile women is four, which is considered the upper limit of normal. But we can still treat, it is left to the discretion of the treating physician to treat those women who have lesser values between 2.5 to 4 when uh, they are older or they have, uh, uh, when they are trying IVF for subsequent multiple attempts or if they have diminished ovarian reserve. Those women with TAI who are to undergo controlled ovarian uh, stimulation must be evaluated before and thyroxine dose adjusted to keep the TSH less than 2.5. And they should be closely followed up after ovarian stimulation. 
the presence of antibody may identify women at risk for developing hypothyroidism afterwards and also during pregnancy and they need to be closely followed up they are also at higher risk for developing postpartum thyroiditis so even after delivery we need to screen them for thyroid function at 3 and 6 months postpartum new thyroid fertile women this is the new change that has come in the recent guidelines that we do not need to treat new thyroid subfertile women with tai prior to uh, art because they have not found any beneficial effect of thyroxine on pregnancy outcomes but on a case to case basis as i have mentioned earlier if they have diminished ovarian reserve older age history of recurrent miscarriage high levels then we have probably an argument to say that we can treat and try to keep the tsh on the lower limit of normal i think with that i'll conclude my session and or any questions are welcome thank you so much uh thank you madam dr anjali uh, satya ma'am that was a uh, very very elaborate and uh, beautifully uh, expressed um, presentation and uh, i always have had the confusion what do you do for patients between 2.5 to 4 because we say cut off is 4 but then sometimes uh, we start treating patients between 2.5 i think you are uh, you really expressed it beautifully like when to start the treatment and especially when they are high risk and when they are going to have a fertility treatment with ivf for hc and uh, Uh, they are of older age then we can start treating them and uh, my question is if we start treating them we are not going to do any harm to them are we that is uh, what it is and uh, i think um, we'll uh, move on with the next session and take the questions at the end rajpriya i think dr anjali can take that question are we over yeah. to the yeah. 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 I uh, say the american thyroid association in 2017 itself had released in its guideline that we must always look at the benefit versus risk ratio there is no harm if we treat these women with smaller doses of thyroxine 25 microgram it's not going to harm them at all but the benefit is there or not is a question so in older women diminished ovarian reserve uh, who have already had multiple attempts at ivf uh, high titers of thyroid antibodies which i told you after controlled ovarian stimulation there's very high likelihood that they'll become hypothyroid I think we are justified in treating them with smaller doses of thyroxine. If I can ask one question, Dr. Anjali, sometimes we see this fluctuations, no? Like you'll be starting them at a dose, and then you'll find the levels uh, drop. So it's, it'll be like the TSH is like a, a waxing and waning effect. It just shoots and drops and shoots and drops. You just would find it a challenge to maintain them at a particular dose. Yeah, normally if it is not outside the scenario of uh, controlled ovarian stimulation, it is generally not a problem because we always start with a lower dose. We should not jump on doses. It's ideally a dose increment should be made by just about twenty five micrograms at a time. and always we see that uh, sometimes the review we have to always reassess after 6 weeks of any dose change many a time we observe that people are called back at 4 weeks itself and then the dosage is increased because the half life of thyroxine is 7 days and it takes 6 half lives for the for the thyroid hormone to achieve a steady state so if i increase a dose from 25 to 50 i would expect a steady state to come only after 6 weeks so don't test before 6 weeks the only scenario where we may do a earlier testing is a woman who comes in early pregnancy with a high tsh there we would start with a higher dose of thyroxine and reassess her at four week intervals because we want to render her u thyroid as early as possible so that's the only scenario where we do at four week intervals otherwise at least six weeks gap should be given between dose hikes i think that's a point well taken yeah. not to overdo things and uh, create more uh, confusions I think uh, if we don't have uh, any further questions, Rajapriya, can we move on to our next talk of the day? Um, it is uh, talk by Dr. Jay Shri Gopal. Can I have her CV? I think Dr. Jay Shri Gopal uh, doesn't need much of an introduction. She is um, director. Um, sorry, uh, yeah, in uh, she is a consultant in Apollo Hospitals, uh, Chennai, and uh, she is a director Daya Indo India, Chennai. and uh, she is in the institute for diabetes endocrine metabolic and lifestyle uh, health and she's got many laurels to her um, name 
and uh, one among that is the uh, recipient of occasional excellence award from the rotary club and she was also awarded the dr sam dr sam gp moses oration at the api chennai chapter uh, conference and uh, the dais is yours ma'am thank you so much uh, dr uma just going to share Between talk one and talk two, I have delivered my patient. I'm sitting in the labor room. <laughs> Hope she doesn't have thyroid dysfunction. No, that's why no, no. I'm just waiting for half an hour before I leave the hospital. <laughs> okay. Is my presentation on full screen? Yes, yes, it is. Yes. yes okay. First of all, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Rajapriya, and all the other office bearers of the Indian Fertility Society for inviting us here today. It's a pleasure to be here, and. Uh, I think Anjali is really set the stage. What I'll be doing uh, is just taking you through a few clinical scenarios because the title of my topic was the dosage and adjustment, and I thought I would also address some typical challenges that we face. Um, so this is like a typical, uh, uh, for example, a typical uh, patient that we would see a 27-year-old lady who's anxious because she's been married for six months and not able to conceive. Her periods are regular and nothing really. Uh, else of note in the history. These are her thyroid uh, values. TSH is 5.12. And the question is, do we treat? And uh, this is sort of the range I'll be using for most of uh, the, the, the ranges that I'll be showing. A TSH of 0.5 to 4.2, 3T4 of 0.8 to 2 nanogram per DL. And this is important because each lab has their own sort of normal ranges and we need to be aware of what that particular lab's normal range is. Uh, of course, in this situation, I don't think there is any doubt. Any lady who's trying to conceive or planning a pregnancy, we would treat. But if you have somebody who has a borderline elevation of TSH, let's say this lady was unmarried or she wasn't planning a pregnancy at, at present, what are the other things we need to look at to help us decide whether she needs treatment? One is, of course, a detailed history. Though we call a value like that subclinical, where the TSH value is sort of between 4 to 10 and the free T4 is within the normal range, uh, it may not truly be subclinical if you uh, get a more detailed history. She may be having hair fall, she may be having joint pain, body pain, uh, water retention, facial puffiness, bloating, some increased flow during the periods. Invariably, they have some symptom which is suggestive of uh, the underactive thyroid causing problems. Uh, the, the physical exam, of course, the most important question to ask would be, is there any, uh, either are they planning or is there any chance of pregnancy? I'm astonished by the number of women, and I'm sure, I don't know if you would see it, but who come and say, I'm not planning a pregnancy, doctor. If you're not planning, are you taking any precaution? No, I'm not taking a precaution, doctor. So, you know, there isn't a, uh, you know, they don't seem to, uh, they don't mind if they become pregnant is a way to put it really. Uh, physical exam, what I look at are things like the blood pressure, particularly if they're obese. Do they have any goiter or nodules? If they have a goiter or nodules, it will be more, we'd be more inclined to treat it. Are they having any water retentions? The deep tendon reflexes are always mentioned, but it's sort of an old archaic exam and we don't necessarily do it anymore. Uh, DTRs, where you have a slowing of the relaxation phase is only really seen in uh, very overt or extreme or long-standing hypothyroidism. Of course, if you see a borderline elevated TSH, we have to ask for a free T4 to make sure we are not missing a uh, central cause for the hypothyroidism. So hypopituitarism, definitely. Also, I'd like to ask for a lipid profile because another reason to treat would be if they have elevated cholesterol and, of course, the thyroid antibodies. And, and, and one thing to point out is, in general, uh, uh, I would advise doing an ultrasound only when the TSH has been normal for three to six months. Usually when the TSH is elevated, the thyroid gland can be slightly enlarged under the stimulatory growth effect of the TSH. So it's better to wait while if you decide you're going to put them on thyroxine replacement, it's better to wait for three to six months before considering, before repeating or doing an ultrasound. Uh, the only exception being if you feel there is a nodule. If there is a nodule, you would go ahead and get an ultrasound of the neck down. So when do we consider treatment? Of course, planning pregnancy or any chance of pregnancy in the next six months to one year, no doubt any borderline elevation of TSH above four like uh, Anjali pointed out, we would definitely start levothyroxine replacement. If they have any change in their cycle pattern, if they have any evidence of goiter or the ultrasound shows changes of thyroiditis, 
if they have high blood pressure, if they have water retention, ankle edema, if they have a high LDL cholesterol, particularly, so dyslipidemia, and if they have positive antibodies, particularly a high titer of anti-TPO antibody, which is more specific for autoimmune thyroid disease as compared to thyroglobulin antibody, and a strong family history. She says, my mother, my aunt, my sisters, we all have a thyroid. Chances are she is on the way to developing a thyroid problem. So even if it was only one value of TSH, which is borderline, but there is a very strong family history, you might consider starting uh, treatment. Now, I put in here any symptom related to the hypothyroidism except weight gain. And we'll come to that in a minute. But just weight gain alone, I would not consider as being strong enough risk factor for starting treatment unless any one of these other factors were present in addition. So when can we just monitor a borderline elevated TSH if they are not planning a pregnancy or there is no chance of pregnancy? So even though they may say they are not planning a pregnancy, if they are not using any precautions, a lady like this, I would definitely go ahead and start thyroxine replacement. Or if the pregnancy, she's, you know, there is absolutely no chance of pregnancy for whatever reason. Uh, but then we start looking at things like if they have negative antibodies, if they have an ultrasound, which is normal, absolutely no symptoms, normal blood pressure, normal lipids, no water retention, no fluid retention. If all of these are present, then we can just monitor and not elect to treat the TSH value. When we go ahead and start treatment, how do we fix on the dose? Now, the usual recommended dose for adults is between 1.6 to 1.7 microgram per kg per day. I think most of us actually go by the TSH elevation. So if the TSH is sort of borderline elevated, say it is four or five, uh, depending on the clinical scenario, most of us would start with 25 or 50 micrograms of levothyroxine. If it is about 10, most often we would start with 75 to 100. Again, like uh, uh, Anjali pointed out, if it is a significantly overt hypothyroidism, a new, uh, newly diagnosed hypothyroidism, very early in pregnancy, she comes with a TSH value of 100 or something like that. In that case, we might even start with a much higher dose, say 125 or 150 for a few days to get the thyroid into the normal range more quickly. But this is the conventionally accepted dose. And of course, it is administered once a day in the morning on an empty stomach. So what is important to, to, to sort of keep in mind from this is we have to be very clear about why we are treating an elevated TSH. There should be some other reason why we are treating it and not just the uh, blood picture, particularly if it is asymptomatic. Now, a slightly different clinical scenario, which sometimes you may come across, so I thought I'll put it up. A 34-year-old lady with thyroid for 10 years who's trying for her second pregnancy. She also has a history of seizure disorder for which she's been on some um, anti-seizure medications. She's on levothyroxine, 100 micrograms for five days and 125 for two days at the time that I saw her. And this is the pattern of the thyroid. Uh, in June 2017, this was the dosage, 100 for five days, 50 for two days. And she had a seizure one week prior to presentation. Uh, so, and when she came in to see me, these were her thyroid values. The TSH was low, 0 0.02 and 1. So we reduced the dosage. We made it 75 every day. The next follow-up three months later, TSH was normal and she'd had no seizures. Another follow-up again, three months later, again, the TSH had jumped to 10, e even though she was on the same dosage of the 75. Again, she had a seizure one week earlier. So we had to sort of, uh, you know, uh, fine tune the dose. And uh, uh, we worked out that she needed a dose somewhere between this dose and this dose. And this is the dosage that we came up with. On that, for about a year, she remained stable. Uh, she's remained stable to date, actually. Uh, TSH remained between 1 to 1.7. Free T4 remained slightly at the lower limit of the normal range. So the two things we need to keep in mind in this are that anti-seizure medications can cause the free T4 to drop a little bit. We need to keep that in mind. And second is that any thyroid fluctuations, uh, whether we are under-treating or over-treating, may precipitate seizures. And the TSH may be temporarily elevated, actually, after a seizure. So when we are adjusting thyroxine doses in people with seizures, we just need to be a little bit uh, careful and remember that uh, uh, they may need more close follow-up, even though sometimes they may be very stable. Maybe you need to check them every six weeks or eight weeks, like Dr. Anjali had suggested. Uh, other common medications that can also affect TSH levels, metformin is a very common medicine. In some people, it is noted that metformin can actually cause the TSH to go down. It causes a reduction in the TSH. 
it does usually tends to happen when the TSH is at the upper limit of normal or slightly above normal to begin with. Uh, I've not really been able to find a, a good explanation for this. And I wonder whether it is related to the weight reduction that typically occurs when some women are started on metformin, maybe because of that, the TSH value goes down. Apart from that, another common medicine that can affect the, the, uh, the, the, the actual values of the levels, glucocorticoids. Glucocorticoids commonly turn TSH off. Anabolic steroids and oral contraceptives, we are very familiar with the OCP effect on TPG and increasing T4. So we need to be aware of the effect of certain medications on various thyroid function tests and uh, decide how we are going to adjust the levothyroxine dose based on these uh, uh, interpretations. Another uh, sort of clinical uh, challenge that we sometimes face, this is a 27-year-old lady, uh, hypothyroidism, impaired glucose tolerance. She's been trying for her first pregnancy. She's currently taking uh, uh, this dosage of uh, levothyroxine, 75 mcg for five days and 100 mcg for two days. She's also on glycomet uh, uh, after food for the impaired glucose tolerance. And she states she's been regular with the levothyroxine she gives a good one to one and a half hours gap between levothyroxine and food. And these are her thyroid levels. Uh, so you can see that uh, this was just before the lockdown in Feb 2020, when I saw her just before the lockdown, this was a TSH value and this was a dosage of, uh, of uh, thyroid. And uh, this was just immediately, literally, I think a week before the first lockdown started. So because the TSH was slightly high, I'd increased the dosage of the levothyroxine. Uh, in May, when I saw her two months later on the same dose, again, the TSH had jumped up. Uh, I said, you know, just continue taking it. I didn't want to change it for this borderline elevation of the TSH. By August, it had jumped up even more. Another sort of three months later, it had jumped up even more. So it was a little bit puzzling because uh, she'd also, uh, she'd actually lost weight because of the metformin, she'd lost weight. So it was a bit puzzling as to why the TSH value and she, and you know, because she was trying to conceive. So the, one of the advantages of doing consultations, online consultation was that uh, uh, she was sitting at home and we were having a consultation. So I asked her to show me the, uh, the thyroid tablet bottle. So while brand A, what, what I had suggested was brand A, the 75 MCG, the two tablets, 100 MCG that she was taking on Saturday, Sunday was a different brand. And that she'd actually switched at the start of the lockdown because of all the problems that happened. They couldn't get uh, a hold of that particular brand. So the pharmacy had just given some other brand. Once she sort of went back to taking the original brand, so the same dose, 75 and then 100, whatever dosage we'd advised. Once she went back to that dosage, the TSH value settled down. Again, this is to uh, point out that different brands have different absorption patterns at times. So if, even though the patients may say that they are taking the proper tablet, it's always useful to look at the tablet yourself. Sometimes a dosage is different. Sometimes a brand is different and different brands will respond. Uh, people will respond to different brands. Some people may do well on say uh, brand A, but they may not, they may need a different dose of a brand B. So it is important that we actually try to see the medicines ourselves, particularly in something like uh, thyroxine. And the other important thing is, we should be telling our patients not to switch brands. So if they are stable on one particular brand of levothyroxine, they need to remain on that brand because if they change the brand, again, the dosage requirement may change. Uh, another sort of interesting case that I had come across was this. A 33-year-old lady was trying to conceive She'd had hypothyroidism since she was 20 years old. Her TSH had never been under control. When she first came to see me, I went through some of her previous reports. Always her TSH was between 15 to 30. And she complained of tiredness and fatigue. Her weight was 35 kg. It's usually hovering between 35 to 38, so a fairly low BMI. So on, on sort of repeated questioning, finally she admitted that she was irregular with the thyroxine because every time she took the thyroid tablet, she had severe burning acidity in her stomach. Um, so the advice we gave her was to take the levothyroxine tablet either an hour after breakfast, so between breakfast and lunch on a relatively empty stomach or between lunch and dinner. So evening time, again, about two, three hours, excuse me, before dinner. Over the next three months, she actually improved significantly. 
Her weight also improved because she did not have that acidity problem any longer. Her weight, up to, weight, weight went up to 47 and she finally uh, uh, reached a normal TSH value. And she was taking her thyroid tablet very happily one hour after breakfast. In fact, I think now for the last almost uh, six, seven years, she's been taking the tablet like this, maintaining a very normal thyroid level. So these are some of the sort of pharmacokinetic uh, features of the levothyroxine molecule. The main site of absorption is in the, uh, the, uh, up the jejunum and the ileum. And only about, say, 70% of the tablet is best absorbed uh, at the best of times. Uh, the absorption of the thyroid tablet, paradoxically, may be slightly higher in hyperthyroid patients. Uh, some of these things, uh, Anjali had already told you. I'm not going to go into detail about this. But uh, that 70% absorption may come down to as low as 50 to 60% if there is the presence of food in the stomach. It's also influenced by gastric pH. So anytime people use uh, anti-acidity tablets, it further interferes with the absorption of the thyroid tablet. So for example, this uh, original pantoprazole type tablet, lansoprazole that was used in hyperthyroid patients was shown to result in increased levothyroxine dosage requirement to maintain the target TSH levels. So levothyroxine bioavailability can be affected by a number of things. In some people, taking it on an empty stomach can lead to acidity problems. So though because the tablet is only 60% absorbed at best, that is the need for the empty stomach. So very rarely in some situations, like in the patient in question, or sometimes very rarely in the first three months after people conceive and they're having a lot of vomiting. So let's say they take the tablet, tablet and they're immediately throwing up. In that situation, sometimes I tell them to take the tablet between uh, breakfast and lunch. Uh, a few other common queries regarding thyroid blood test. When do we do the thyroid blood test? The TSH really can be done at any time, but there is a circadian uh, pattern to the TSH. It tends to go up a little bit in the evening time. The T4 and T3 definitely gets affected by food intake. So best to do it in an empty stomach before taking the thyroid tablet. Um, I think I'm going to, so this was a case where someone who comes 38 year old lady, she's G2 L1. She's not planning a pregnancy and the periods have also started to become irregular. Maybe she's perimenopausal. The question really is uh, uh, previously in June, 2020, at the start of the lockdown, when her weight was only 65, these were her thyroid reports. A year later at follow-up, you can see that her uh, repeat TSH is 6.5. She's gained seven kilos in interim. Antibodies were negative. She had no pointer and lipid profile was normal. So she was asked to just uh, lose weight. She's encouraged to lose weight, maintaining a low carb diet. She loses five kilos and a repeat TSH is three. So this comes back to one of the points that Anjali had mentioned in her talk that weight gain itself can cause TSH to go up. Maybe because of the influence of leptin, which is made by adipose tissue and weight loss can uh, uh, reverse this condition. It can cause the TSH to go down. So if there is no pressing need to treat an elevated TSH, try to recheck after weight reduction. Uh, the final clinical scenario is something that uh, Dr. Rajapriya had a question about. So this was a series of tests done in this lady, 35 year old, uh, uh, primary subfertility, hypothyroidism with positive thyroid antibodies for on, on liver thyroxine for 10 years. And uh, she was referred to me because of this fluctuating thyroid values. And you can see this is the pattern of a thyroid. In 25th Jan 2019, this was a thyroid, 100 mcg. They were planning ovarian stimulation, so dose was increased to 125, trying to maintain the target below 2.5. Two weeks later, the test was repeated. TSH had gone up. This was about three days after the OS. TSH had gone up higher, so the dose was increased to 150. Two weeks later, when it was repeated again, the TSH had dropped the other way. TSH was 0 0.04, 3 T4 had increased further. The OS was unsuccessful. This was the point where she came to see me. I just reduced the dosage back to 100. And I said, we try to get your thyroid into the normal range. And a month later, when she came back, her TSH was okay. Uh, it was 2.8, 1.4. Uh, and I'll explain about, I had asked her at that point in time to continue with 100, probably see her and again in a month's time, and then consider adjusting depending on what the TSH value is like. So uh, again, Anjali had alluded to this. The fact that uh, 
the uh, usage of both the gonadotropins and the HCG will affect the thyroid levels. So ovulation induction will increase estrogen, which in turn can increase TSH levels uh, through the through because it increase, reduces the free T4 levels. And this increase in the TSH is more pronounced if they have baseline thyroid autoimmunity or if they're on liver thyroxine therapy. This peak occurs three to five days after the uh, ovulation induction, and it settles by 10 to 14 days in, more, in most women, but it may persist up to three months as per a few studies. So this is important for us to know because it tells us when we need to do the thyroid blood test. Uh, these are the guidelines that uh, Anjali had alluded to, the 2021 European Thyroid Association guidelines. Um, this is what they say. Prior to OS, prior to ovarian stimulation, if the TSH is more than four, we do need to treat. It does not matter if antibodies are positive. It does not matter what the free T4 is. Any TSH more than four, we would treat. Prior to OS, if the TSH is between 2.5 to four and antibodies are positive, they say go ahead and treat. If the TSH is between 2.5 to 4 and antibodies are negative, then this is what Anjali was alluding to, a case-by-case -case scenario. After OS, if you go to after ovarian stimulation, what is recommended is that you check the TSH on the day of the confirmatory or the second HCG testing. Um, if they are on treatment for hypothyroidism and adjust to keep the dosage of TSH below 2.5. If at that point in time, the TSH, which was normal earlier, has started to go above 4, or if they have very strongly positive antibodies and there is a significant rise in the TSH, go ahead and get started on levothyroxine uh, replacement. Continue to monitor them through the pregnancy, particularly if they have high titer of thyroid antibodies. You may do it about once in every trimester or once in every two months. It depends upon the clinical situation. What is important is that the thyroid function testing should be performed either before or one to two weeks after controlled ovarian hyperstimulation because results obtained during the course of the COS may be difficult to interpret. In general, I would say it's better to do it one week before or three days before the, I would say one week before, because if you need to adjust anything, then you can do the adjustment. And then if you want to check it again, best to wait for at least three weeks after the, uh, the, the uh, procedure or after the therapy, after the injection, before you start uh, checking it again to give enough time for this ovarian stimulation effect to have settled because otherwise it causes problems like that case that I had presented. It's going up and down. It was all happening only because of the effect of the uh, ovarian stimulation. And if we just waited it out, the thyroid levels would settle down. So there is no need to check it during the procedure. That is where the problem arises. So to summarize, thyroid disorders are very common, particularly in the uh, infertility scenario. They are very easy to diagnose and to treat. The art really is in the finer nuances of trying to treat and trying to maintain the levels within the accepted range. Understanding the physiology of the TSH fluctuations and the pharmacokinetics of levothyroxine and its half-life and its absorption helps us further in clinical management. That was my last slide and uh, thank you. I'm happy to participate in the panel. Thank you, Dr. Jayashi, for your excellent presentation on this very important topic. Uh, you have uh, clearly made out by presenting case-to-case -case scenarios. So that has uh, given us an idea when to, like for example, in a case of ART, when to start doing TSH. That is probably on day three, I would prefer, or even the prior cycle, not during the cycle of planned ovarian stimulation. And uh, if you want to modify your uh, treatment or recheck, Quote, six weeks is ideal. Exception is that when the patient has got a very high levels of uh, hypothyroidism, like say when the TSH level is beyond 100 or 150, because we do come across such situation. And then again, you have clearly uh, said that uh, when you should do the antibody estimation and which is the antibody that is very essential for uh, infertility aspect is concerned and uh, when to start the uh, thyroid supplementation especially when the antibodies are positive with the like uh, in the subclinical rate or when it is between even between 2.5 to 4 try to maintain the level of tsh below 2.5 then again you have uh, uh, mentioned this clearly the drug interaction because it is very commonly we use metformin along with uh, thyroxine levothyroxine in infertility patients so that how the 
there is interaction between the metformin and the thyroxine. You have clearly given an idea. And again, interaction with the anti seizure uh, drugs. And uh, uh, I think it was an excellent presentation, uh, which has clearly given us an idea how to use judiciously the entrox, uh, I mean, levothyroxine. And more than that, you have stressed upon the importance of taking a single brand. Because very often I find, suppose if the patient doesn't get one brand, he, she will immediately move on to the other brand. So I think that should be avoided. So thanks for your valuable inputs. And uh, Rajapriya and uh, Uma Velmurgan. Uma, anything else you want to add up? Dr. Shweta, you want to make any comments? Dr. Add up. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was you, uh, elaborated. Thing. I think when we'll go to question and answers, I have certain questions which comes to this 2.5 to 4 TSH and do we really really need to get so alarmed just because we are doing an IVF so I would really like to get this input from all our three you know expert panelists so I think I'm waiting for the question answer session and uh, we'll clear our doubts and that okay I guess we uh, very clearly understood this evening that yes just play a crucial role we just can't uh, consider that we are giving medications and we can just play around with the doses and sort out the problem. I think both the endocrinologists made it evident that uh, we need to liaison with the endocrinologists and do the best for our fertility seeking patients. So Ramni Devi ma'am, shall we proceed to the- Yes, yes, of course. Eagerly waiting for their uh, panel discussion. Or rather a question answer session. Um, I'll request you to introduce uh, both of us and then we will uh, take over to the panelists, ma'am. So the moderators for this current session will be Dr. Sveta Metal, who is a convener for ASIG Reproductive Endocrinology Group of IFS. And of course, the other moderator is none other than Dr. Rajapriya Ayappan, who is the secretary for IFS Tamil Nadu. So I'm, uh, Sweta Metal is a senior consultant and IVF uh, specialist and gynecologist from Sri Gangaram Hospital, Delhi, and past editor IFS, past member infertility SIG, Foxy, holds advanced endoscopy fellowship from Germany and fellowship in IVF from Israel, holds expertise in IVF, laparoscopy and histoscopic surgeries and ops, and she has received CME Excellence Dronacharya Award by IHW Council Advisory Board, Economic Times of Times Award, Inspiring Gynecologists and IVF of India, Doctors Conclave, June 2019, India News Award, IVF and Gynecology Conclave, 14th May 2019, New Delhi. Welcome you, madam. Thank you so the much. Next, Dr. Rajapriya Ayyappan is uh, Managing Director of Srinivasa Priya Hospital, Parambur. Uh, she is an executive committee member of uh, uh, Fertility Preservation Society of India, OXI, and ATN RCOG. FOXI Endometriosis Committee, she was a member when I was a chairperson of FOXI Endometriosis Committee, and we have jointly done so many programs together and a wonderful experience with her. Secretary Parambur IMA Women's Wing, Secretary Indian Fertility Society of Tamil Nadu ch Chapter. Over to Dr. Ajapriya. Thank you so much, ma'am, for those kind words of introduction. I'm very glad to get this opportunity to be holding this particular session along with Dr. Shweta Mittal. I think we've introduced two of our speakers, Dr. Anjali Satya and Dr. Jayashree Gopal. And uh, very clearly during their talk, we've understood that endocrinologists play a tremendous role ensuring the endocrine and metabolic balance is maintained of the precious patients we are handling. I request Dr. Shweta to introduce Dr. Sudhir Tripathi. So uh, Dr. Sudhir Tripathi is uh, chairman and head of the department, senior consultant at Sir Gangaram Hospital. And he has over three decades of experience as a clinician and 20 years as an endocrinology physician. Uh, other than that, I can just say that he's our saving savior. I don't think there's any day which goes without, you know, getting a consult from him. And uh, I think he's one of the most favorite for all the gynecologists of our hospital. Uh, so we welcome you. 
And uh, of course, Dr. Anjali Satya, we heard a brilliant talk uh, regarding all the autoimmune issues uh, regarding to thyroid. And she's again, just a word that consultant endocrinologist uh, from March 2006 till date at Vijaya Health Center, Vijaya Hospital, Chennai. So have we introduced her earlier? Then we can move on. Is the screen visible? Yes, it is. Yes, yes. So this is a question and answer session. So because I think uh, both our previous speakers have given us an outline uh, how thyroid and fertility has an interplay. We're just trying to highlight uh, certain discussion points which has already uh, been uh, discussed by both of them uh, during the proceedings of this evening. So I would uh, go over to the first uh, discussion where this particular 23 year old is married just one year. She's of very high BMI. Her TSH is also very high, 110. Her cycles are not that regular. It's not a typical three by 30. And she's very comfortable with that weight saying that I've been hypothyroid for over five, six years. And I've always been heavy. A lot of time obesity is taken as a comfortable factor to be hypothyroid. So hence you're very fat. Now this particular person, however, when she comes with this TSH of 110 and anxious to conceive, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Jayashri Gopal, I would like you to take this question. How much of time would generally be taken if she's in a hurry to become pregnant? How much of time would it take to bring this uh, level of TSH 110? Because sometimes we jump and give a very high dose in an eagerness to bring it down fast. So how do we go about? Because she's not been going to any doctor the last one year. She's not been taking her medications properly, but she's a known hypothyroid for the last uh, five years. So the first part of the question is how much of time should be taken? So we tell her this is not going to be an easy task. She can't be in a hurry to get pregnant. And uh, if she's in a hurry to fall pregnant, she wants quick ovulation induction and things like that. What should be advised as components of pre-pregnancy counseling? Dr. Jesh. Yeah, so I mean, certainly somebody like this, first of all, you know, I would reassure her that being 23, we have some time at least to help her get pregnant. Uh, I would definitely be more concerned about her BMI of 39. Uh, the TSH of 110, we can get it under control. How soon? Like uh, Anjali said, probably about six weeks to three months. However, I mean, if it is an emergency, so I'll take the question another way. Let's say this TSH of 110 is somebody who's awaiting and the free T4 was low and she needs to go for some sort of elective procedure, semi-elective procedure, let's say whatever, some gallbladder surgery. I would say within a week, we can put her on a high dose and get the TSH lower and the free T4 into the normal range and give clearance for surgery. But obviously that is not the case over here. Here, I would definitely say it'll take six months for the thyroid to be normal. I would also, so what I've taken to doing is also explaining that the Egg formation itself takes four months. The egg that is made every month takes at least four months. It has its genesis four months earlier. So make sure that even at the time of the genesis, your egg is healthy. So that, and all along the, the egg is healthy. So wait for a month or two till your thyroid level is normal. Wait for another two, three months after that, ideally, till the thyroid levels come into the normal range. Use that time, use the next three to four months or six months, ideally to lose weight, because that is more of a concern for me during the pregnancy. So the question is not really how soon can I get the thyroid into the normal range? The question more is how soon can I get her into a healthier, optimal pregnancy range? And definitely I document, I think we all do that. I document saying, I've clearly explained that she needs to attempt pregnancy or think about a pregnancy only after the TSH is below 2.5. So I make a note of it in the uh, prescription, just, you know, just for sort of, uh, because what happens, they turn around, they'll turn around and they'll say, oh, you know, you never told us that this would be a problem. You never told us that this, it may not be anything related to the thyroid, but they would, you know, hang it on the thyroid. It's difficult to prove it. So it's always important to document, I think, that we have explained that too. Right. So I, I guess that kind of summed it up. Dr. Anjali, Dr. Tripathi, any further comments on this particular? Um, I think I have two points to add. Um, that is, you mentioned that this lady is hypothyroid for five years and her TSH is 110. So the first thing that comes to our mind is her non-compliant state. 
So I think she has to be counseled that she should be regular with thyroxine to achieve a U thyroid state. Now, as an endocrinologist or as a basic physician, I am worried more about her weight than her thyroid. Because we know that higher BMI itself has uh, adverse pregnancy outcomes. It would lead to higher miscarriage rates, higher prevalence of gestational diabetes, higher prevalence of hypertension. So she needs to have a clear uh, cut, a metabolic uh, a clearance also before she actually attempts pregnancy. So she should have a baseline workup for sugars, uh, cholesterol, her blood pressure, and she should be counseled that a BMI of 39 is quite high. And she should focus on weight loss. She's only 23 lot of time. Uh, weight loss itself is going to help her a lot. And of course, and if she uh, achieves a youth thyroid state by being compliant with her thyroxine, uh, time factor is not important here. Uh, 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 sir, would you add on something, sir? Or you? Yes, I think I tend to agree with the, the other speakers. They have uh, put the thing into the right perspective. Uh, reducing weight is extremely important, more important than thyroid itself. And thyroid is uh, easily treated with an uh, increasing dose of thyroxine at all. So re reducing weight is the crux of the problem because we know that being obese, she'll have a lot of problems in pregnancy and during her pregnancy. And therefore, we must focus on weight reduction. That's one. Then we must also tackle the other metabolic factors. Uh, it, just the obesity is not there. It's uh, probably associated with high cholesterol levels and high blood sugar levels. So we need to think about that. And currently, there are certain groups of medicines which are used in the treatment of diabetes, which can actually make them reduce weight, like the newer group of drugs, which is the oral semaglutide. It's a wonderful drug. It makes you lose weight. If, if she's a diabetic, that would help. Even if she's not a diabetic, some other oral, anti -di other oral drugs are used, which can reduce the weight. So that's very important. So in the overall perspective, reducing weight is the most important. And another point which was suggested by one of the speakers was that uh, if she non-compliant, because at the end of five years, if her PSA is still 110, that's pretty odd. She should be totally uh, urged to be compliant with the treatment, and that would go a long way in ameliorating the problem of hypothyroidism. Very simply done. So probably we can just summarize saying that some of them are caught with chronic hypothyroidism and they have to be compliant. And then we should never be in a hurry as a fertility clinician to jump and get them pregnant, but rather address these comorbidities, give them enough time, at least give them a wide framework of time saying that three to six months till she achieves the target, uh, we will not be pro proceeding further with ovulation reduction or anything else. So coming to the next uh, situation, a uh, good lot of women at this weight are very comfortable saying, uh, I'm a thyroid patient, so I have always been heavy. So could it be a very comfort zone for thyroid patients to feel they can offer to be heavy? So how do we address that, Dr. Anjali Satya? Uh, most of the patients with hypothyroid uh, definitely have obesity as a probable comorbidity. Whether that is a causation or it is a coexisting problem, that is something we need to look at. So we look at the family history, whether they have a family history of obesity or uh, has the weight gain happened after the onset of hypothyroidism. Now, even in the most overt cases of primary hypothyroidism, the weight gain is very, very mild. It's not uh, extreme uh, weight gain. What we see is only to the tune of three to four kgs weight gain, even if the TSH is say, extremely high. And that is because of water retention. And once we start them on devothyroxine, they start losing. They the average weight loss that we observe in the first two months is about two to three kgs. That is because the water has gone. So what remains after that is, I think it's more lifestyle related than hypothyroidism. So I think that we need to impress upon them that don't blame thyroid for everything. Uh, probably we need to look at all these factors. Obesity is essentially a lifestyle issue and uh, we have to spend time on, I think, counseling there. Dr. Tripathi, we have observed that some of these patients think that thyroid, uh, thyroid supplements itself is like a weight reducing medication. Even without even a thyroid function test, a low dose of 25 to 50 microgram is started by the general practitioner. So any comments on that? That's uh, absolutely true. And we see this every day. We see patients coming with thyroxin being given for weight reduction. Even if they're hypothyroid, they take a larger dose, just so lose weight because with the initial dose, they don't lose weight. And they just presuppose that the thyroid is responsible for the weight. So you take a larger dose, it should help. But that's absolutely wrong, the way to go about it. And we that will lead to a lot of other problems. Like in a young female, she may even then tolerate the high dose of uh, thyroxine. But in an older female, uh, the risk associated with osteoporosis would increase if it is carried on for a long time. So if it's, they are subclinically hyperthyroid in a way, if they're taking an overdose. And also it would increase the heart rate and lead to PSVT and other uh, 
uh, arrhythmias of the heart. So it's a very uh, dangerous situation to take a high, a high dose of drugs for weight reduction, a thyroxine. And currently, I think there's also a trend to using T3 in addition to T4 for weight loss. So that's also a very bad combination for weight loss and um, that should not be done at all. It's not a weight reducing tablet, it's just for replacement of the thyroxine deficiency and that's about all. Now, uh, there is a situation when uh, as ART clinicians, sometimes we find that with uh, uncontrolled hypothyroidism or well-controlled hypothyroidism with raised uh, thyroid peroptase antibodies, we have very poor oocyte quality. Could there be a link, Dr. Sutira? Do you feel that uh, we need to address antithyroid antibodies? And there is no way as of now when we are measuring anti-ovarian antibodies. Could there be a link to the equality concern? And is it essential for us to make sure that the uh, antithyroid antibodies are in control before we stimulate these patients? Is it? Yeah, you're yeah, absolutely correct. This is a, a new area of uh, research now. And we know that uh, the there are receptors of, for the various thyroid hormones also on the various, uh, like the granulosa cells and the ovaries, there are lots of receptors related to the thyroid antibodies as well as to the uh, thyroid hormone receptors. And this plays a very important role. Anti-thyroid antibodies uh, are known to reduce the quality of the oocytes, and that is very important. And anti, uh, in fact, the only antibody which is of great importance is the anti-TPO antibody, also called the anti-microsomal antibody. And the anti-TG antibody, as a matter of fact, should not be tested because it's not required to be tested. It has no role to play in this uh, particular aspect of this uh, thyroid autoimmunity. But anti-TPO antibody is very important. And if you can get get some degree of control in the anti-TPO antibody uh, prior to the um, uh, ART procedure, then that would help along, go a long way in uh, preventing this deterioration in the oocyte or egg formation. Dr. Anjali, when do you think uh, we should be checking these levels? Like Say the person uh -huh. is not well controlled TSH. What when would you suggest to check these levels? Uh, we do not routinely test for thyroid antibodies in already diagnosed patients with hypothyroidism because uh, when we treat them with thyroxine, we do not see a great fall in antithyroid antibody titers. They remain high for a lifetime. Now people have looked at that. We render these patients U thyroid with thyroxine, but the T few antibodies remain high. But we really do not have a strong evidence to say that these antibodies are causing the adverse fertility outcomes. That's number one. People have looked at, studies have looked at uh, steroids and even uh, IV immunoglobulins. But as of now, even all the thyroid societies in the world have not uh, supported this therapy uh, to primarily target anti-TPO. I think uh, future research is required to look at the role of these uh, uh, TPO antibodies in the follicular fluid, whether they have any local effect, uh, whether these uh, receptors, they say that even now, most of the primary uh, method of assisted reproduction is ICSI, uh, not IVF anymore. So it is bypassing the contact between the sperm and the zona pellucida. So bypassing the, you know, the antigen antibody reaction. So we really do not know what uh, is... Uh, I mean, whether targeting these antibodies uh, improve the outcomes. We don't have evidence. And I think in this era of evidence-based medicine, unless we have a strong support there with good data, we cannot go ahead with other alternative therapies. But thyroxine will not bring down the anti-TPO antibodies. And we don't look at that on a general basis. We don't screen all people with for thyroid antibodies. No. I have a comment to make on this. Can I go ahead? Please, sir. Yeah, the anti-thyroid antibodies, anti-TPO antibodies have been known to affect the response of the thyroid hormone to pregnancy. So if you are pregnant and uh, thyroid hormone antibodies are positive, then the response of the thyroid gland is very sluggish. And therefore, it's important to correct the antibody levels. And it's also seen that the antibody levels in general denotes an autoimmune state, a, a sort of situation in the patient. And they can have antibodies to like uh, lupus. They can also have the anti cardiolipin antibodies. So those should also be tested. And sometimes we treat that condition, which is associated, that may help the outcome of the pregnancy. And we've already discussed the oocyte uh, issue. That's a separate issue altogether. So antibodies are a very important role and there are evolving guidelines are coming out in the, in the terms of the antibody treatment. And we're not sure what helps, but they said selenium helps. A lot of uh, earlier initial research showed that about 200 micrograms of selenium can go a long way in reducing the antibody titers. But that's not very sure, very definite. And I think the data is a little old in that front. So we'll have to wait for more data. And it's a gray zone in the treatment of thyroid antibody levels at present. So this is actually a scope for future research. And we have to understand that we cannot expect great equality at times. And probably look at the angle that other coexisting autoimmune disorders can 
be there. I mean, that's a very interesting thing to think about. Dr. Jayashri Gopal, I think you had a lot of talk about uh, the dosing and how often uh, should it be tested. And what, a lot of patients, uh, when they first diagnosed of hypothyroidism, they're very uh, concerned whether it's going to be a long-term problem. Some of them are even uh, hesitant to start thyroid supplements, saying like, would this become part of my life forever? So when do you think uh, uh, you would be able to prove that this is going to be a chronic concern for the patient? So... Uh... If at all they're planning a pregnancy, what I tell them is certainly you need to be on the thyroid tablet till you have the baby, till you finish feeding. Once you finish nursing the baby, we can think about stopping the tablet. If at all you're planning, say, two babies, once you've completed your family, we can think about stopping the tablet. It may be that once, while you're on the tablet, your thyroid levels will look normal, but it does not mean that your gland is working normally. All it means is that we're giving the right dosage of the thyroid tablet. So... When does it become a chronic concern? I think the concern that people, women have is that because they're starting the thyroid tablet, it is going to become a chronic disease. They feel that somehow if they do not start the tablet, it is not going to become a chronic disease. And if you sort of remove that, but as doctors, we don't look at it like that. You know, we have to start the thyroid tablet and no matter what we do, it is going to either become a chronic disease or it's going to be a temporary disease. So uh, in, in terms of, so if it is a lady planning pregnancy or any chance of pregnancy is there, no, no questions asked. I say you absolutely need to. This is the advice, very important for you and for the baby. After you've finished having the baby or baby's family, then we will come back to this issue. Stop the tablet for a few months and see if your gland is back to working normally and we can monitor it. And in terms of how often must the test be repeated, usually uh, once you start thyroid tablets after six weeks, in pregnancy also more frequently, every six to eight weeks if possible. Anyhow, if, uh, if a lady is on chronic levothyroxine therapy trying for a pregnancy, I still ask them to do the blood test every three months. Sometimes there are some fluctuations of thyroid uh, and we do not want sudden, you know, she may have had a thyroid, which was absolutely normal a year back. She becomes pregnant with the TSH is 25 and she gets all alarmed. So it's a good idea to just get it done every three months and to give her the range, tell her that, you know, if it is normal, this is fine. Or just send me the reports. I'll take a look at it. So when they are trying for a pregnancy, I do it a bit more frequently. So how, how, how much would you say that chronicity is to what percentage of patients once you're finding abnormal levels, what percentage of patients you think are going to end up being chronic today in clinical practice? Um, I don't know if I have a good answer for that, honestly. It's a very good question. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe one of the other... Uh, what, is the, what is the question once again? Oh, so I just want to know, like once you're diagnosing hypothyroidism, what's the percentage of patients who are going to become chronic from there? Or will it be 50% of them or 75% of them or much more than that? Like chronic. once hypothyroid, always a hypothyroid. Like, uh, yeah, I would feel that once hypothyroid, always a hypothyroid, unless in specific situations like a postpartum thyroiditis, that can be temporary. And then you have the regular like garden variety of subacute painful thyroiditis, and then that is temporary. In some, some situations of drug-induced hypothyroidism, that can be temporary. But on an average, I think if you have primary hypothyroidism, which is either autoimmune or non-autoimmune nature, then it's going to be a, a lifelong issue. So one should not uh, like rush into treatment. Straight away, if you have a TSA of 4.5 or 5 or something like that, then the cutoff limits are above 10 for treatment. But in pregnancy and in infertility situations, you can have... I mean, even is a gray zone. They, they mark it on gray color. That this is not the stage in which you can treat them. If you need to treat, you can observe them for three months and then decide if the TSA goes up beyond four, you may treat them. Thank you so much, sir. Dr. Anjali, uh, we, we were actually having during the process of your talk and even Dr. Jayashree saying that there is an interlink between polycystic ovaries and thyroid dysfunction, which came first, whether the thyroid and they are actually kind of interlinked. So do you think... Uh, when two coexisting endocrine problems are there, now how different are they in management with thyroid supplements rather than isolated uh, primary hypothyroidism? Which is a bigger challenge and how often would you think of testing in these situations? Um, I think the women with PCOS are a category who are at uh, a high risk for developing autoimmune thyroid disease. I mentioned in my slides that uh, thyroid autoimmunity is commonly seen in these three categories of patients. One is women with polycystic ovarian syndrome because of the genetic polymorphisms they are uh, and because of the high estrogen progesterone ratio they are at high risk for th developing thyroid autoimmunity 
Second is women who have a diminished ovarian reserve, low AMH counts, and who have been already diagnosed to have primary ovarian insufficiency. Most of them may have underlying autoimmune cause for the same. So many, many a time we see what is known as polyglandular autoimmune syndrome. So one of these diseases may present first. So sometimes we see these women as presenting to us with hypothyroidism. And in the course of time, as we follow them, they may develop irregular cycles. And when we evaluate them, we found them, find them to have high FSH. So they can develop premature ovarian failure. They can have autoimmune B12 deficiency, vitiligo, uh, you know, sometimes even type 1 diabetes. Now, PCOS women uh, have a higher risk for developing uh, type 2 diabetes and autoimmune thyroid disease. And we screen them for them. Once we diagnose a woman to have PCOS, we screen them baseline. For one is the blood sugars, the lipid profile, thyroid profile. We have, if they have irregular cycles, also check for prolactin. So here the treatment strategy is not different. Hypothyroidism is treated with thyroxine. But if a woman with polycystic ovaries is found to have normal thyroid function, we tell her that she must uh, screen the, uh, I mean, do the repeat the test on a periodic basis, at least once a year or once in two years. And we tell her the warning symptoms of hypothyroidism. That is if there is an unexplained weight change, weight gain or other symptoms of hypothyroidism, then she must screen herself for that. A woman with PCOS also needs to be screened if she's planning pregnancy. So as Dr. Jayashi said, we should do these tests prior to pregnancy itself, do a GTT before she plans. So preconception counseling becomes extremely important in these category of patients. So a woman who comes with a polycystic ovaries, we are already seeing her to have all these coexisting problems. We have to screen for that or look for that. If she already has a family history of autoimmune thyroid disease, all the more. So all women with PCOS, we screen them for autoimmune thyroid disease. All women, we screen them for diabetes because these are highly prevalent because of the underlying insulin resistance. And we do the other ancillary tests based on the presentation. Thank you so much. And uh, Dr. Tripathi, how would you, like uh, when you're dealing with an early pregnancy, a newly diagnosed hypothyroidism in a pregnant woman, and she's really worried and concerned whether this hypothyroidism is going to affect her baby, and so how would the discussion be when we are diagnosing hypothyroidism for the first time in early pregnancy? Like she'd be worried about the miscarriage risk and how are we to be prepared? Like say she's getting a very high value, say it's around 25 to 30 TSH. Uh, sometimes it's alarming that it will affect the intelligence of the baby. So how do we counsel them about in utero and neonatal hypothyroidism aspects as well? I think that's very important. This is a very uh, interesting facet of uh, endocrine practice because we see a lot of women who come in the first trimester with uh, thyroid dysfunction, TSH may be high. Some of them have mild subclinical hypothyroidism and sometimes they have very high levels of TSH and sometimes wonder how they conceive because it, normally the fertility is very poor when you have a high TSH. They come upwards of 50 or even 100 TSH and they've conceived quite, uh, without any IVF procedures and spontaneously. That's very interesting. But what needs to be told to the patient that firstly, if it is subclinical hypothyroidism, they should be treated with a TSH level. The target should be less than 2.5 so that the outcomes are optimum. And secondly, they should all get their antibodies tested, anti-TPO antibody. That's very essential. And that would also help focus on the, uh, the maternal and the fetal outcomes of uh, uh, hypothyroidism. And then we must target the TSH level. Like the first trimester, the TSH target is 2.5 and below. And second and third trimester is less than 3. But that's also evolving and changing now. The, it's a moving target. And we are not sure what the exact precise target is, but this is the general target set for the treatment of hypothyroidism. And this question of the, uh, of the effect on the fetal brain development is very important because that really um, is uh, extremely important in the outcome, the fetal outcome. And we know that the brain dev starts developing in the first trimester. And if you have a patient who has not been treated in the first trimester, the likelihood of some deterioration in the IQ levels is always there. And it is suggested that uh, IQ level of about minus seven is uh, roughly seen at about the age of five years or six years. And therefore, it's very essential that they should be treated appropriately and at the earliest possible. Another issue in this regard is patients who are hypothyroid and become pregnant, what should be done for them? They, they, for them also, the targets are the same. TSH should be less than 2.5. And uh, therefore, these are the targets which are set and they should be treated according to these targets and the treatment should be as early as possible so that they achieve the targets at the earliest. And then the, this brings us to the question of monitoring. How frequently do you monitor them during pregnancy? I think we should monitor, in the initial when the dose is given, they can be, the first uh, monitoring can be done uh, after two to three weeks initially. 
and then subsequently it should be done at the rate of about four weeks. The TSA should be monitored every four weeks, and uh, the TSA monitoring should continue up to twenty weeks of gestation at four weekly interval, and then you can slow down a little because by the time the fetal uh, thyroid is also developed. But even after the fetal thyroid develops, the maternal uh, the flow of the T4 across the placenta continues to a certain percentage, and therefore it's not that the mother is not contributing. The mother continues continue to contribute until almost the term, and therefore you must have these targets set and achieve those targets of thyroid hormone, thyroid hormone replacement. Dr. Jayashree, you want to add on any comments to it, especially from the neonatal side once they are born? So one of the things I do try to reassure them because. There is not much we can do regarding the miscarriage risk, but at least in terms of the, the effect on the baby's development, uh, I mean, they're obviously they're extraordinarily anxious and they you know go and read things on the internet. One of the things to point out is that a lot of the studies which have been done looking at the IQs of these children, where they've shown that the IQ points of untreated hypothyroidism, all of that was a retrospective study done uh, in, in uh, untreated hypothyroidism. So that's one thing I point out. And I say, uh, like Dr. Tripathi pointed out, as long as we get the thyroid levels up into the normal range quickly, we can, you know, we've seen successful outcomes in pregnancy. We have seen women who come like this. So we've sometimes had women who present with a TSH of 100, 120. And uh, uh, quite often the, the, the outcomes are good. You know, the babies are good. Uh, and they go on to lead normal lives. So there doesn't seem to be a problem. So it's more a lot of reassurance because there is no way, but we also have to sort of, uh, um, you know, give a caveat saying there is no way I can predict what the outcome of this pregnancy or, or what, you know, the fact that the baby has been conceived at the time that the thyroid is not okay. There is no way any doctor anywhere can predict. There is no test we can do. There is no scan that is going to pick up any problem that is going to happen to the baby. But with this thing, with the information that we have, we can successfully predict a good outcome. So, say that we are having a goiter in an infertile woman. Like, what are the base things that the gynecologist needs to do? Like, uh, when would they suggest an FNAC or are all goiters? Like, just, a, just, I would like Dr. Anjali to make a comment. Okay, so uh, whenever a person comes and we find that she has a thyroid gland swelling on clinical examination, so we do a proper clinical examination to see whether it's a diffuse thyromegaly or can we clinically palpate any nodules or not. Uh, sometimes smaller nodules we can miss clinically and that can be picked up by ultrasound. So, uh, uh, so on clinical examination, if it's a diffuse goiter, then we look for even cervical lymph nodes. What is the consistency of the goiter? Is it rubbery or is it very firm to hard? If there is a nodule, what is the size of the nodule? Is it a hard nodule with irregular margins? So clinical examination is extremely important, uh, followed by the blood test. So first, what we do is the TSH. Now, if the TSH is normal, then uh, we, and if it's a diffuse thyromegaly, we also look for family history of autoimmune thyroid disease. Then we can actually check a thyroid antibody titers in that woman because she has come for a complaint of subfertility. If her thyroid antibodies are high, she has a diffuse goiter and TSH is normal. So this is a person whom we need to follow her up once she gets pregnant. So that is the clinical scenario here. Now, the, the how we are going to manage will depend on what are the findings on. Uh, ultrasound is ordered for when we suspect a nodule. It's very important. Nodule in uh, infertile women should be evaluated like any other person. If ultrasound shows a suspicious nodule, a nodule which has a microcalcification, taller than wide nodule, irregular margins, presence of cervical lymph node, then we need to order for a fine needle aspiration cytology and take the decision likewise. If it's a benign nodule, we reassure her and tell her that she can go ahead with her fertility treatment. And if antibodies are negative, TSH normal, we still follow her thyroid functions in pregnancy as we would do for any woman in first trimester. Uh, the third scenario would be, uh, so ultrasound is a thing. And if a woman is found to be thyrotoxic, now if TSH is suppressed, what do we do? So if TSH is normal, we do an ultrasound and we take the following decisions. If the TSH is suppressed, we ask for an uptake scan to see if there is a, a high uptake nodule. Does she have a toxic nodule or is the uptake value high? So sometimes women may present with thyrotoxicosis. Mild thyrotoxicosis, they may miss. And if they are thyrotoxic, we try to tell them that 
we need to treat them, render them U thyroid. And after U thyroid state is maintained for a couple of months, only then she should seek uh, fertility treatment. Because as I mentioned earlier, untreated severe hyperthyroidism can also lead to uh, first trimester miscarriages. And also the regarding anti-thyroid drugs. So if the patient is put on carbimazole, we have to tell her that uh, she is rendered euthyroid. Once she conceives, and if she's already euthyroid, we in fact stop the anti-thyroid drugs because most of these drugs are uh, embryotoxic. Uh, potentially they can cross the placenta and go. So first trimester patient is mildly hyperthyroid or euthyroid, we withdraw the medicine. After 12 weeks, then we take a recall, we reassess her. But if she is grossly thyrotoxic, we switch over to propyl thyroid in the first trimester. And after 16 weeks, we switch back to carbimazole. So that is a treatment when we deal with a thyrotoxic woman with a coit. Thank you so much, Dr. Anjali. Dr. Shweta, I request you to uh, uh, take over from this particular discussion. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I think we have had a very extensive uh, discussion. So just summing up, I just wanted to start from very basic. So when we as uh, infertility specialist or gynecologist are dealing, just want to, uh, I want you all to summarize that what are the common thyroid disorders, what we should be thinking of? I think I can, Dr. Anjali can, you know, answer. I would want all the panelists. So a woman who has, uh, who comes with subfertility, we definitely, we need to screen all subfertile women for thyroid. So she can be either euthyroid, she can be hypothyroid, she can be subclinically hypothyroid, or she can be thyrotoxic. These are the three possibilities of which a euthyroid state is more common. Hypothyroidism, again, is a, a problem which we can detect by doing TSH. So the simplest test that we can offer is a TSH combined with T4. If you have facility to do free T4, free T4 can be done along with TSH. There's no role for T3 estimation in diagnosing hypothyroidism. Most of the time, clinical examination and history itself will give us a diagnosis. Whether she's thyrotoxic or so weight loss or unexplained weight gain can give us a clue. So T3, we don't do for hypothyroidism. But T3 has a role in diagnosing thyrotoxicosis. Sometimes we see a segment of women who have TSH suppressed, T4 normal and T3 high. So that is called T3 toxic. Is there, is there, is there any uh, specific questions we should be asking in our OPD when we are Definitely taking Definitely, yes. So the symptoms of hyperthyroidism are quite vague because uh, the, uh, the symptoms they ask, you know, what we ask for is, do you have weight gain? They may complain of fatigue, low back pain, or muscle aches and pains, sometimes menstrual irregularities. So weight gain itself may be associated with menstrual irregularity. So sometimes it's very difficult to decide. They may have constipation, bubble issues, hair loss, anemia, um, menorrhagia. So these are common complaints of hypothyroidism, cold intolerance, not any symptom, not all these symptoms are present in one patient. So sometimes we have to put leading questions, but most of the time they complain of weight gain and tiredness and sometimes muscle aches and pains. Hyperthyroid patients, weight loss is highly sensitive. So that's why we, when we treat patients with hyperthyroidism, with antithyroid drugs, we ask them to maintain a monthly weight record. And weight gain is a good sign of response to treatment. So hyperthyroid patients, they are very weight sensitive. Weight loss is complained by almost 90% of the patients. Menstrual irregularities may not be seen as commonly as is seen in hypothyroid patients. So we have to take a history of weight gain or weight loss other symptoms of hyperthyroidism is sweating, diaphoresis. Hair loss is universal. It can happen both in hypo and hyper. Skin may be dry and coarse in hypo. They may be sweaty and warm in thyrotoxicosis. Sometimes patients with thyrotoxicosis complain of uh, something like an evening rise of temperature. They feel warm. People with subacute thyroiditis also complain of feverish symptoms. So I think a lot of these diagnoses can be had uh, by clinical history and so, if so, yeah, examination. Yeah. A good clinical history taking, I think, is so much more important. Uh, maybe it will give you a much more, you know, insight than just asking for the test, which we yes. saw out and out do it. Yes. Uh, Dr. Jeshri, you tell me that always mm -hmm. hypothyroidism or any thyroid disorder is so much so related to female mm -hmm. infertility. So how often do you see men, you know, getting affected and how uh, do you think that we should even start thinking? Because, you know, men are always neglected uh, more so when it comes to uh, infertility or, you know, any other issues. So I think Anjali clearly pointed out in her talk, uh, while it is not recommended that the thyroid be done routinely for all couples, the men approaching, unless they have erectile dysfunction, uh, uh, 
that is the only situation. I still think, I think it's helpful to get a good history from the man also. Particularly if they have a strong family history, you do a basic physical exam, they have a goiter. I think it's reasonable and particularly if they have a high BMI. Anyway, you're going to screen them for diabetes and cholesterol. I think it's important to include a thyroid panel in that. So I think it makes sense. Whether it affects men and women, I think the question is, does treating hypothyroidism in men have equal impact upon the pregnancy outcomes? And I think the answer to that is not very clear as yet. Signif yes, overt hypothyroidism in men, if you treat it, it is definitely going to impact upon sperm quality and pregnancy outcomes. However, subclinical hypothyroidism in men treating it, I don't think there is any data saying that it affects fertility outcomes. So thyroid disorders are definitely more common in women compared to men. But should we not screen men? I don't think so. I think men also need to be screened equally, so particularly the, when they approach us. If you don't find any other cause for, say, low counts or low motility, would you suggest in men to do a thyroid function? Very definitely. A thyroid along with a... Uh, but again, making clear that a subclinical hypothyroidism, particularly with a normal prolactin, is unlikely to be the cause for the azoospermia. Okay. But they would need to be treated for other causes anyhow. Uh, Dr. Tripathi, now since these patients come to us and we see very varied reports, we see sometimes people have, you know, asked for a TSH level. Some uh, of us, we like to get a free T3, T4, TSH panel and some you see that it's just a T3, T4 and TSH. So can you give us a clarity that when we are asking for the test, which test to ask for in a subfertile woman uh, and why? Okay, so the basic test, the first test has to be when you're trying to rule out a thyroid disorder, it has to be TSH. That is the screening test of priority. And if you have a TSH level, which is either normal or low or high, if you have a low TSH, then obviously you're thinking of hyperthyroidism. If you have a high TSH, you're thinking of hypothyroidism. So that's the basic premise. After that, the next important test is a T4 test. T4 is very important because T4 gives an inkling about what the status of the uh, the level of TSH, uh, how is it correlating, whether it is subclinical hypothyroid, subclinical hypothyroid, or is just uh, overt hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism. So if you have a low T4 in combination with a high TSH, it's hypothyroid primary. And if it's a low TSH with a high T T4 level, then you have hyperthyroid. So that is the basic way of going about it. And thereafter, the number of tests that can be done are innumerable. For instance, if you have, you need to do a thyroid antibody test in a patient who has hypothyroidism, anti TPO antibody is a drug of antibody hyperthyroid has a suspicion of Graves, then you must do a TSH receptor antibody, as it's called the TRAB. That's being done more and more now. In pregnancy in particular, it's very important. A lady who is hyperthyroid Graves disease should have an initial um, T3 uh, anti, uh, sorry, the TRAB antibody test done. And if it's levels are more than 2.5 times the upper limit of normal, then you have to repeat it at 20 weeks. Because at 20 weeks, the TRAB antibody would suggest that if the fetus is going to be affected by the hyperthyroidism in the mother, the TRAB antibodies process the placenta and affects the fetus, the fetus will have fetal hyperthyroidism. So that's so important to know whether the fetus has hyperthyroidism and they have the, the, the fetal heart rate is important in that regard and that can be monitored. So you have a varied variety of tests. The TRAB antibody is a very interesting test that has come up recently. An anti tp antibody for hyperthyroidism and T4 and TSH should be the bottom line. And of course, you do an ultrasound if you think of a nodular variety of hypothyroidism, whether you want to of a goiter when you are talking about, we discussed this earlier, if you think of ruling out a malignancy or something other, akin to that, that was a different issue altogether. Probably not relevant to the discussion on infertility. But hyper and hyper are very important to diagnose pre-pregnancy and during pregnancy, of course, we follow it up with various tests, other tests. Yeah, so, th so that makes it very clear that the initial screening test should be a TSH. And then if you want to add on, it's a T4 to further, uh, you know, diagnose it. But however, T3 is something which will not be of that much of use. But there is a, definitely a role of anti-TPO antibodies and the antibodies which Dr. Pati just mentioned to know whether there will be a, a you know, risk of fetal hyperthyroidism. So uh, with this coming back, I think we discussed, but just I wanted to know that when we look at male partner, when would we perform the uh, thyroid function? test, I think maybe Dr. Jayashree can again elaborate that uh, she, I think we can just uh, go ahead with it because at normal semen parameters, she said that, yes, we would be getting it done. If there's an erectile dysfunction, then it's very important. Are there any other uh, indications where you would get a thyroid uh, mm -hmm. test in males? Uh, maybe Dr. Pati can give and Dr. Uh, you know, Anjali can add on to it. 
uh, sometimes men come with uh, erectile dysfunction and hypogonadism, secondary hypogonadism, and we definitely look for prolactin levels in them. So somebody who has hyperprolactinemia documented in a field, we should also look for a concurrent thyroid function because sometimes overt hypothyroidism itself can lead to secondary hyperprolactinemia. So male fact partners also should be examined. I mean, if you have a clinical suspicion, as you said, higher BMI, or they have family history of strong family history of autoimmune thyroid disease in their families, they, they can be screened. Plus, of course, all these symptomatic categories that you have mentioned here. But they have uh, uh, azospermia. I mean, so there are, are these specific limited indications, but other than that, a very strong family history, I think, is important and we should not ignore it. Okay, so we'll just give some clinical scenarios in the next slide. Uh, and uh, we can ask Dr. Jayashree that, uh, let's see, so you can get a patient whose T3 is normal, T4 is normal, and TSH is 4.5. So uh, with this and infertility, are you going to start treating this patient? Yes, definitely. I mean, I'm using a TSH of about four. So definitely I would consider starting therapy. Uh, on, on somebody so like this. Dose, you would start with this kind of so, a mildly high TSH? I would probably start off at 25 micrograms. Okay. Most and, often. And, unless and they are... Repeat the test to see whether it has... I would repeat it in about uh, six weeks, four to six weeks. Now, during this time, would you ask this woman to conceive? Should we do some ovarian stimulation or we should wait for the TSH to come down to below 2.5? So in general, I always encourage people to go for any sort of pregnancy therapy or to try for a pregnancy after the TSH is below 2.5. I think Anjali very clearly mentioned in our talk about the many ways in which the thyroid interferes with ovulation or abnormal thyroid. So I think the chances of successful pregnancy outcomes are also much better. Any sort of therapy, ovulation induction, follicular study, any one of these things, the, the outcomes are better when the thyroid levels are in the normal range. So definitely wait I would advise waiting till the thyroid levels are normal before proceeding with any sort of treatment. Okay, uh, uh, sir, uh, for you, if suppose the T4 was in the lower range and TSH was about 8 or 10 or 12, what would be your starting dose in this particular case? If the patient has a low T4 as well as a high TSH, here the TSH uh, shown is 8 and the T4 is low, then I would begin with a higher dose, maybe with 50 micrograms because you have to correct the T4 as well as get the TSH down to the normal range, which is less than 2.5. So I think we start with 50 micrograms, but it will also be dependent on the weight of the patient. If the patient is extremely obese, then start with a higher dose because the dose of thyroxine is weight related. It's in terms of micrograms per kg body weight. The, to, the real dose is about 1.6 or 1.7 micrograms per kg body weight. So that's the ultimate dose that can be given. But you start with a 50 micrograms dose and monitor it. If the patient is pregnant in the first trimester, then you do it uh, in the first two to three weeks after starting the dose. And then you can titrate it every four weeks until 20 weeks as we discussed. But pre-pregnancy, you can, if the patient is not pregnant, then you can uh, do the testing once every four to six weeks to adjust the dose to get to the target levels of TSH as well as T4. So, uh, sir, in this particular case, uh, when will you advise pregnancy to this? Is, is there a situation where you see that the TSH starts coming down and maybe it has reached 2.5, but the T4 levels are still in the lower range of the normal. Now, in this particular case, would you still increase the dose further or you would just go on the TSH levels? Uh, well, as, as I presume you are talking about a lady who is not pregnant as yet. She's yes, planning not pregnancy. not pregnant yeah. as yet. So in this situation, one could uh, get the TSS to less than 2.5 because that's the target for. And if the T4 remains low, even after correcting the T4, uh, TSS levels, uh, that generally does not happen because the T4 corrects itself first and then the TSS lags behind. So if you have a patient who has a low T4 and a high and a normal TSS, that's an unusual situation because it's akin to what we call as hypothyroxinemia in pregnancy, but that happens only in pregnancy. So outside pregnancy, we cannot explain a low T4 uh, with a normal TSS. Okay. So in this situation, one would not like to increase the dose, just recheck the patient. And I'm sure that if his TSH is corrected, the T4 would also correct spontaneously without any increase in dose. So Dr. Anjali, do you think that there are lab issues? Because, you know, many a times we get a thyroid function test done. And when we think that we should have, you know, seen this particular lab doing it. So do you judge your reports just by, you know, where they are performed? I think that's where... Uh, yeah. Clinical examination also uh, is important. Suppose you find laboratory parameters that don't fit 
sometimes uh, into, you know, the like as a previous scenario where you mentioned that in spite of starting thyroxine, the TSH becomes normal and the free T4 still remains low. We would think of an unusual scenario like even central hypothyroidism. We may screen for other pituitary functions. So in central hypo, the TSH may be either normal or slightly elevated and T4 remains low till we give a higher dose of thyroxine. So I think we have to interpret these tests uh, based on what we have, what information we have gathered. Laboratory tests, yes, it matters. TSH is a very ultra-sensitive assay. We normally don't see major differences uh, between labs, but yes, the usage of kits, uh, the quality control, whether they run their QCs for every 50 samples, that's why it's always good to uh, tell patients to give their samples in larger labs where they deal with higher number of samples. Sometimes we do find uh, tests where the TSH may be high and the T4 also may be high, uh, which does not fit the clinical scenario. There we may again go and repeat the test in a more standard lab. So laboratory parameters, yes, we need to have an insight into the laboratory uh, variations that can happen. Dr. Jayashree, is there any particular time of the day when you ask the patient to get these tests done? Like for prolactin, we say that nine in the morning is better away from the menstrual phase is better. So, or have we, you know, because nowadays we order thyroid function test at any point of the day, irrespective of the meals. So I think I'd alluded to this. The TSH, ideally, both the TSH and the free T4 better best done in the morning, empty stomach before taking the thyroid tablet. The TSH... There is some variation in the TSH during the day. There is a little bit of a spike in the TSH, maybe by about 0.5 points or so in the evening time. There's a little bit of a circadian rise in the TSH in the evening. And we need to be aware of it, particularly when you're trying to interpret borderline value. So let's say you told me this TSH of 4.5 was done once in some lab, you know, at five in the evening, I may say, okay, let's go ahead and repeat it. So ideally for, uh, you know, practical purposes, I would say try to maintain this rigor of doing the TSH and free T4 empty stomach in the morning before taking the thyroid tablet. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Tripathi, just last, suppose if the T4 was very high and the TSH was low, then you start suspecting hyperthyroidism. That's right, yeah. Okay, so, uh, well, we'll skip this question because this we have discussed many times that when we want to attempt conception, the TSH level, everyone wants to maintain below 2.5. And... Uh, is it mandatory that when they are booking for, you know, pregnancy that we do a thyroid function test? I think the unanimous answer was that, yes, we should do that. And uh, when will you advise thyroid antibodies? I think this also we heard pretty much that if it is between 2.5 to 4.5 and uh, 4. So that is the time where thyroid antibodies, I think, play a role. And which uh, is there anything else, Dr. Tupati, you want to add when it comes to when should we add thyroid antibodies? I think thyroid antibodies should be done in every patient of uh, hypothyroidism. When you have a high TSH and a low T4, or uh, either subclinical or overt hypothyroidism, you must do the antibody level, especially the anti-TPO antibody in all patients. However, anti-TG antibodies are not mandated and does not need to be done, so there's no point wasting money on that. And especially in a pregnancy or an infertility scenario, antibodies are very important because they would dictate your treatment. If you have a patient with a subclinical hypothyroid and antibody positive, he may like, she may most likely need treatment. If the antibody is negative and you have subclinical hypo, then you can wait for that uh, treatment to start. So that depends. So antibody is a very important role to play. Anti-DPO is a must to be done in almost all of these patients. I also wanted to know one more uh, clinical scenario. Suppose we get a patient who is suddenly showing a reduced ovarian reserve, doesn't have endometriosis or any other known case. In that patient, by detecting an anti-TPO antibody, even if TSH is, say, in the normal range, would you be adding, if you are thinking that possibly you, she has anti-ovarian antibody, so would you be adding some thyroid supplementation? Because it is just a speculation. I would like to get everyone's uh, view on that. I feel my point of view is that if you have a patient who has a, a antibody positive and if you have TSH between 2.5 and 4 and you find that within this range, it's a normal range, but you have the TSH in the upper reaches of the normal range, like you have a 3.9 TSH with antibody positive versus a patient who has a 2.5 TSH with the antibody positive. There may be a case for treating the lady with a TSH in the upper reaches of normal. That would help immensely in improving the outcomes. But that's a controversial area. It's a gray zone and there's no conclusive evidence either way for that. So we'll have to wait for more conclusive evidence. But my suggestion is that if you have a TSH within the 
high normal range, even that may be an indication that the patient may develop hypothyroidism and should be treated. Dr. Jayashree, do you come across such patients referred by, you know, fertility specialists where uh, the ovarian reserve seems to be decreasing and they're concerned that is it autoimmune in, you know, origin? And I mean, I think I agree with what Dr. Tupati is saying. I go by what the TSH is. So if the TSH is, say, 1.2, 1.3, 2.2, I would not consider treating, even if the antibodies are positive, but keep it under close observation. Uh, if I see a 3.8, 3.9 positive antibodies, definitely consider starting levothyroxine replacement only because I think they're going to develop hypothyroidism and that fluctuating TSH may potentially impact upon, will further impact upon this, uh, the egg quality and the poor ovarian reserve and the ovulation. So I think more in terms of optimizing things, I may consider replacing thyroid. So suppose if her antibodies were positive and TSH was very low, when is it when you would repeat the antibodies just to find out that is she getting hypothyroid? Is there any recommendation? Antibodies do not need to be repeated. Antibodies will be positive. Antibodies will fluctuate. No, I'm antibodies sorry. will and fluctuate TSH between TSH about once in three months or six months. Okay. So if they're antibody positive, then you would recommend every three months or six months, we keep doing her TSH. Yes. And, and also I wanted to mention when you were talking about fertility treatment, another place where I find sometimes this gets missed is that the thyroid is done routinely at, at the first time that they come to see you. At the end of about a year of treatment, a lot of these women have gained weight. At that point in time, the thyroid is not checked. So, uh, Continue to check it. Check it every six months, even if it is very, very normal in the beginning, even if antibodies are negative in the beginning, do continue to repeat checking it at least every six months or so. Okay. And Dr. Anjali, do you uh, believe in having a thyroid function every trimester or uh, if they are youth thyroid, then we don't do it at all? Uh, I think it has been clearly mentioned that those women who test positive for thyroid antibodies and have been youth thyroid before pregnancy need to be followed up in every trimester, because as the pregnancy advances, the demand and the stress on the thyroid gland increases, and uh, they are likely to develop subclinical or overt hypothyroidism in pregnancy. But if they don't have antibodies and her thyroid function was then, not... Then I would just do one test in first trimester. Okay. okay. That, that's what I would do if she has a family history. So I think all antenatal women must be screened, because we do not know how they're... Even if... Because... Not all autoimmune thyroid disease, again, are antibody positive. There's a small percentage of patients who have goiter, uh, diffuse thyromegaly, but they may be antibody negative. So there is a caveat to every situation. It's not universally that they are going to have, some of them may have thyroglobulin antibodies, some of them may have both the antibodies, some of them may have isolated TPO, and some of them may be antibody negative, where we make the diagnosis of autoimmune thyroiditis based on FNAC. That's the only indication where we do a needle test. So there are situations in every condition where we choose our tests based on what we encounter. Yeah. And I think Dr. Anjali very nicely told us regarding hyperthyroidism that how she would like to stop in the initial part and give propile PTU. And then it's only in the later part that she would like to change over to carbimazole. So I just wanted to know opinion from Dr. Jayashree and Dr. Tripathi, and then we will end this question and answer session. And when it comes to hyperthyroidism, how would you like to go about it? Same as what Dr. Anjali mentioned. I don't think I have anything else to add. I think, I think universally it will be... Dr. Tripathi, do you want to add something? And any other special test you want to do in these patients or monitor other than, you know, uh, the drug therapy? In hyperthyroidism? Yes. Yeah, I think we discussed this issue of the TRAB antibodies, uh -huh. the receptor antibodies. They are important to be done yeah. in the beginning and then at 20 weeks so that we can detect fetal hypothyroidism. And also the important role of uh, a concomitant therapy like beta blockers, you generally would tend to use a labetalol instead of etanolol, which you use outside of pregnancy. And other drugs like iodine and all are not used. In J Japanese patients, they've used iodine for treatment of uh, fetal hyperthyroidism, uh, even the maternal hyperthyroidism, that's not accepted worldwide. So these are some issues which need to be resolved, but otherwise it's a fairly standard treatment. And the use of PTU versus um, the carbamazole group of drugs, that needs to be discussed later if the time allows. But I think uh, that's a big issue. So we can take it up some other time. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Rajapriya, do we... I think 
this I think also they had answered no okay, oh yeah this they had already this is one thing which keeps coming to us uh, just one word i think we can have that you know see we've done the ivf part and she's awaiting an embryo transfer and suddenly during you know when we are giving her hrt we see that she's gotten she performed a tsh and that's seven so should we go ahead with the embryo transfer or should we defer it um it depends on how much time it takes for doing the embryo transfer and how much time lag is there between the... Um, we have about a week or 10 days, uh, you know, yeah. by the time we need to take a call on the embryo transfer. I think we have time. We can give the patient theranum and we can uh, replace the theranum and that should help in uh, resolving the issue. And then we can and go ahead. An unexplained miscarriage, will the treatment be the same with our decision? Pardon, what's the question? If, if suppose she's had a previous unexplained miscarriage, because the patients are very, very anxious. So uh, with this kind of a TSH, the invariably anxious, should we go ahead with embryo transfer or should we defer it? I think if the lady is very particularly concerned about it, then you should defer it because uh, deferring it by another month or so will not matter. And uh, you can get the thyroid well controlled by the time the next embryo transfer takes place. But even I think I just have to one because now you're doing only frozen embryo transfers. So time is at our disposal. So it's not that necessary that this month, it, we can always keep it for the next month by which time she can be rendered in thyroid. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I mean, I agree. And I think it's also to do with the timing of the testing. So, uh, you know, if this was, this could just reflect, particularly if the TSH value just before the ovulation uh, you know, the stimulation protocol was, uh, or, or whatever it is, the protocol that you're doing, if the TSH value was say 1.2 or 1.3 and the free T4 was very normal, I would certainly say, let's wait till we do this. Uh, if it's a very anxious person, very definitely. I think I agree with the other panelists, wait and get it into the normal range. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I think this was, one of the best, uh, you know, discussions on thyroid disorders uh, I heard got so many inputs and learned so many new points in the practice. Dr. Rajapriya, would you like to end? I think they have made us uh, safer gynecologists, no? By giving a tremendous input, do no harm. I think uh, was the point they made very clear: not to overtest, not to play around with doses. Make sense and sensibility of what we are dealing, and then correctly, appropriately refer them to the endocrinologist. The tricky cases. So we deliver the best service to the patients. As you rightly said, I think the last two hours there's been intense uh, discussions on thyroid. And uh, we are so glad that all the great endocrinologists, Dr. Jay Shukopal, Dr. Anjali Satya, and Dr. Sudhi Tripathi were able to give their valuable time. Dr. Ramni Devi, ma'am, you want to make any closing comments? I think the second part was very interesting because it was all case scenarios which we face day to day and uh, all the um, learned endocrinologists had given their uh, excellent views and I think we, we have really learnt a lot from this uh, particular panel. Thanks for the opportunity Rajapriya. Thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Uh, I must say thanks to the delegates also who have taken their time and uh, uh, spent the last two hours learning about thyroid and fertility. If I can just request all of you to stay on screen just for a minute more. And uh, Chitrakala, can you take a quick uh, snapshot of all of us? Chitra sure. sure. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. That's the first time that we had a great session together. So wishing you good luck to getting back to your evening session of practice. And thank you once again for taking this time for us. And thank this you. is Francis on behalf of IFS Tamil Nadu, South Tamil Nadu, and the SIG group of the uh, Reproductive Endocrinology. Thank you so thank much. You. Bye, thank everyone. you. Thank you very much. Thank you.